let me ask you a question. You guys have known each other for a long time, and you clearly have a great – I mean, you're great friends, and you have a great – creative synergy a, a great creative connection how come you haven't done something more no. substantial together like uh a, you know your own band your own you know your own you know, what, 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 whatever uh, Ralph, I'll, let, I'll let you take this Ralph. i about to say Ralph, Ralph put his head in his uh, hands there for a second <laughs> oh it's <laughs> big picture's frozen i cannot talk anymore Greetings, friends, and welcome to episode 202 of Into the Necrosphere. This week, I am welcoming back to the podcast no less than three of my fellow horsemen of the podcasting apocalypse. We start with Mike Hill of Tombs and Scorpion Throne, the host of Everything Went Black and co-host of Necromaniacs, joined by Ralph Schmidt of Ulfa and Ropes of Night. He is intermittently the co-host of Everything Went Black, and they were on hand to talk about their latest collaboration, a split EP with a band. And call off paying tribute to the great Sam Hain. If you stumbled onto this podcast by mistake, uh, Sam Hain for reference is the band that Glenn Danzig was in right before he decided to take his own name and go solo straight after the Misfits. Uh, to many, it represents some of Danzig's finest work, uh, and it is almost certainly worthy of praise and worthy of uh, rediscovery if uh, you have uh, cast it to the back burner over the last couple of years. So we spoke about that. Uh, we got an update on everything Tombs and Ulfa related. Uh, and the two of them also answered the question, the critical question, why they have not done more together over the span of a two decade long friendship. To get us in the mood for that, we travel back in time by two years to a day when Tombs recorded a Sam Hain cover of their very own. This is a song called The Shift.
originally performed by Sam Hain and featured on an album called Initium. You just heard the Tombs rendition of the song The Shift, uh, and it is available right now on Bandcamp. Check out the link in the description to the podcast if you want to go and pick it up. And if you do, then let Mike and the gang know that it was old Jackson at Into the Necrosphere who sent you. Now, I mentioned at the top of the show that there are going to be three horsemen of the podcasting apocalypse on this week's show. That's because uh, the great Carl Hikara, the Reverend Carl Hikara, will be joining me for my weekly news rant. So stick around for that at the end of the show. That is where we round up some of the latest singles being released by your favorite bands for judgment. Uh, We listen to some music, we talk some trash, and we have uh, a whole lot of fun. Uh, If you're new to the podcast and you like what you are hearing so far, then make sure that you elbow drop the subscribe button on your platform of choice if you've not already done so. Uh, Follow me on the socials. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and X, and head over to the Into the Necrosphere Teespring store if you want to show your love and support for the podcast and get some merchandise in return. Uh, I mentioned my horsemen of the podcasting apocalypse on multiple occasions. Now, if you don't know who they are, we kick off the week with Horrorwolf 666, hosted by the inimitable Brandon Legion. Every Tuesday, yours truly casts hexes and slays poses on Into the Necrosphere. I have got, I think, about five episodes left until uh, I take a break for the remainder of 2023, but I have got an absolutely crushing lineup between now and the end of the year. So uh, I will make sure that this podcast ends off on the highest of highs. Uh, Also, I want to say thank you very much to everybody for the huge support for last week's episode uh, that I did with Woe. A lot of you very excited about Amp Wall, which was the uh, Bandcamp alternative that Chris was talking about. Um, So please continue to sign up for that. Again, I'll post the link in the description to the show. Uh, Let's get behind him and uh, let's turn this into something that uh, is not only a feasible alternative to Bandcamp, um, but is something that the whole world sits up and takes notice of. Speaking of which, every Wednesday, the whole world sits up and takes notice because that's when Mike Hill, Sensei Mike Hill, releases a brand new episode of Everything Went Black. He returns every Thursday with one of my favorite podcasts of the week, uh, the fantastic Necromaniacs, alongside his co-hosts, uh, Sheriff Mike Scandado and Professor Jeff Kashid. And then every Sunday, the Reverend Carl Hikara, who joins me later on for the news rant, brings you another installment of Soul Knox, and then intermittently waiting in the wings is the great Cheyenne of the band Trivax, uh, and he drops an episode of his podcast Iblis Manifestations when you least expect it. Uh, so make sure that you join us in the war against mediocrity, and right now, make sure you sit back and enjoy as I welcome back to the show Mike Hill and Ralph Schmidt. Holy welcome to uh, Into the Necro here gentlemen uh very nice to see you both again and happy halloween because that's what the that's when we are going to be dropping this um you guys have any halloween plans before we get uh get started on today's danzig worship sermon actually i do um my uh my lady and i are going to see halloween on the big screen this evening so that's uh you know for on halloween evening like projecting into the future yes yeah. So that's going to be a lot of fun. We've been looking forward to that for weeks since they announced this, the uh, showing. That's nice. Um, here, uh, I have a PTA on that day. Oh, <laughs> which, fuck. Yeah. Eight hours of PTA meetings, which will uh, blow. But uh, ever, like after, because it's not a holiday here. Um, all the people celebrate here is the Reformation Day because of Martin Luther that like separated yeah. the. And we got a church from the Catholic church. Um, but yeah, I have to be in school the whole day. And then like now you've got some people running around in costumes here, but it's mostly to get hammered and laid. Mm. Um, but fun- oddly enough, the small cinema that I back, they will do a double feature, which is Halloween one and exorcist one. And I'm so going to be there. Yeah. Well, the irony is, so you're, you're doing like, you're watching both movies that, I'm watching one. Mike is watching the other because I'm going to watch The Exorcist on Halloween. Yeah. Um, I, I I would assume by this point, Mike, you guys will have dropped, and I'm not going to tell you to reveal any any secrets, but you you guys will have dropped your review on uh, The Exorcist Believer. I I myself will not be watching it because the one truism that I've taken away from 2023 is that if it doesn't star Jason Miller, I'm not interested in seeing it. If it's a movie about exorcism, and uh, and I I started watching The Pope's Exorcist. I got to minute 23, 
I felt dirty and ashamed and I switched it off and I immediately watched the original again. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's how strongly I feel about it, as of, particularly as of this year. I, I, I've, I've come to realize I feel so strongly about The Exorcist that watching any other Exorcism movie makes me feel like I'm, I've cheated on my, on my fiancé. <laughs> it's like, that's, that's how I feel about it. Fair enough. I mean, I mean, as much as I love the movies, I love the uh, the books. You know, mm. Exorcist and Legion. Um, they're just, especially Legion. Like Legion is like this, like really bleak, like meditation. You know, on mortality and consciousness and all this sort of stuff. And and the Exorcist three really captures that sort of brooding vibe. You know, like the one and three are so different. You know, and yeah. Together, they make such an excellent story. I think. Well, three is a is a is a movie that I. I mean, it's it's one of my favorite movies of all time, and I, I interchangeably sometimes almost prefer it to to one. I am glad that that William Peter Blatty got the opportunity to make that and bring in some of the personality that he had, and and you know that was in the the original Exorcist book that um, freaking took out, you know. And I know that a lot of the dialogue and a lot of the stuff, you know, he thought was superfluous when he was directing it. Um, but actually having it there, I think, really adds a lot to the richness of the story, especially the dynamic between uh, Karis and Kinderman, uh, you know, Karis and, uh, not Karis, yeah, Karis and Father Dyer, Father Dyer and Kinderman. They, they, that, that that friendship, that bond, I thought, I've always thought was, especially when you read the book, it, it's, it's a very, very... It, it lends a very human touch to it, and it makes you invest in it even more. Um, so I'm glad that he was able to almost bring some of that back because some of the dialogue from Ex from the Exorcist book is actually in the Exorcist three movie. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. <coughs> um, we uh, we spoke just before we got started on uh, like what's happening in uh, in the Tombs camp. Um, you mentioned you guys are gearing up to start potentially putting something together for uh, 2024. What's uh, what's happening with that? Well, like the last few years has been an ongoing you know writing process, uh, but in November we're going to actually start pre production for the next record, and uh, that's going to the actual recording of it is going to start in mid December. So uh, all of the November into December is going to be uh, pre-production demos and, you know, working on finalizing song arrangements and lyrics and, you know, doing that sort of thing. And then we're going to be recording the record in December and it'll be out in the uh, late spring, early summer of 2024. And then, you know, we'll be hitting the road like, <laughs> like, uh, like we do every time we put out a record. Hmm. And have you, uh, like, uh, can you give us a view on what the what the material is going to be sounding like or what direction it's taken? Uh, it's, I think I say the same thing with every record where I say it gets more extreme and more subtle at the same time. So it's like, but that's true. I think that in this uh, case, there's a lot more uh, aggressive, like, brutality on the record. Like, the songs are, you know, our tempos are up around 200 BPM in some cases, uh, a lot faster there's a lot more like technical playing on it um but then on the other hand there's also these very brooding sort of uh you know introspective songs that lumber along with like uh more personal sort of lyrical content you know masked behind the nihilistic philosophy that uh that very schopenhauer-esque philosophy that i try to put forward in my my lyric writing so uh yeah, there's a lot more textures. Like those songs tend to have like more clean singing, like more sort of croony like vocals, um, and just more atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And the faster, more aggressive songs are just like you know, there's like breakdowns and like fast parts, and there's something for everyone on this next record. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Yeah, well, the, the 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 speed and the aggression and all that sort of stuff. Like I I've known you now for four years, I think. Which is fucking crazy to think, but but you, I, I have noticed over the last couple of years, you have become, you you seem to enjoy more and more aggressive, nasty shit like you know werewolves, dying. I mean, obviously in this year for death metal has been nuts. You know, you've had dying fetus come out, cryptopsy, cannibal corpse. Is, is it is it kind of some of that rubbing off on you when it comes to writing tombs music? Not really. I mean, I think I mean I love I've always loved death metal. I've always loved extreme music and like you know my older older pre teams bands have been very abrasive, you know, and uh, it's just, um, I think that having a drummer on board with this lineup that can play at those tempos uh, is probably the key to us being more aggressive in that direction. And, uh, 
you know, that that's really it. I mean, as you know, the drummer is like the most important member of the band. <laughs> and, um, and having a guy who can pull that stuff off, I think, has really opened up new horizons for us as far as that sort of extremity goes. Uh, Ralph, last night I uh, I spoke to uh, a friend of yours, Chris from Woe, and after he had finished running you down and calling you all sorts of names, he did say that author band is not too bad. It, 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 it reminded me, one, of how fucking killer you guys were at Reaper Fest. Um, that, to me, was still like... I, I I think I openly said it on the podcast. It, I had a lump in my throat for the entirety of the last song. Absolutely extraordinary. Now, we are going to talk about a, a, a new author track uh, in, in a second, but just as far as actual music is concerned, have you started putting any thought toward writing anything new, specifically as a follow-up to the last record for author? Mm, yes. Um, we, uh, we started playing shows. First of all, sorry that my voice is a bit shot, but I have been ill for three weeks now and I just can't get rid of it. And uh, so like that's why I cough a lot and my voice is a bit hoarse. Um, right. But um, from, from, from screaming at bosses <coughs> down at your, uh, at your flat. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, it's crazy. I had fall holidays. We had two weeks off and I pretty much was just in my apartment being ill the whole time. Um, but yeah, like uh, before that, like in September, I played two shows every weekend with three bands because I don't have enough on my plate. So I just joined a third band to play drums for them. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I didn't I know that you're a drummer, but or that you can play drums, by the way. Yeah, well, yeah. It's, it's the good thing is uh, it's like stand up drumming. So I don't have yeah. a kick. So I just have to do like the you know, four to the floor, more like jangly beats. Yeah. It's cool. Like I, I actually played uh, on two records. I played as a drummer, but uh, I like my hand foot coordination is totally off. I need to work mm -hmm. on that. But like the stuff with two hands, I'm pretty good at. And there's this couple here from Cologne that calls Suir, whatever, like it's not a real name. It's S-U-I-R. And they've mm. been doing like this really shoegazy kind of Tropic of Cancer, Lebanon over post-punk over the years. And they always had a drum computer and we were hanging out and they were like, oh yeah, we really would like to love to have a drummer because they're friends with Underground Youth and Black Modern, two bands that I absolutely love. And I'm like, yeah, I can play that shit. Mm -hmm. And so, like, my big mouth got me into trouble, and now I have to do it. <laughs> but it's actually fun. It's really cool because I don't have to write shit, not at the moment, because they all have the songs. Mm -hmm. I just, like, learned the drums and changed them over. So we had that. Uh, we played a bunch of shows with Robes of Night, some with Ulfa, some with Robes of Night and Ulfa back-to-back. -back. Um, and we were driving around and... <clears throat> the the push for a new author release always has to come from me. Mm. Um, and I now I have like the the dust for all that has never been true has settled. And um, I know where I want to go now Be mm. because I finished off this trilogy that I wanted to finish. And now it's completely open. And I mean, it, it's not, it might not be a surprise when I say that, to me, the plan for the new record is to write a score for a movie which doesn't exist. Hmm. So I, my basic idea is to take the tropes of the last Ultha stuff. So have like some straight up black metal songs and have some straight up just experimental stuff, which like meanders into each other with some ambient parts that repeat. So, like, in a classic score, you will have melodies that reappear. Yeah, and that's something yeah, yeah. you usually don't do when you write, like, a metal record. You, you don't have riffs that appear in the same, like, different songs. But that's kind of, like, what I want to try out now. Is there a riff that I can use, like, in three different songs, played differently, but, like, the same notes? And the others are all on board. And I think, like, the new Swans record, which came out this year, is, like, a huge push again for us because that's always if swans release something or runs a pazuzu that's always the time when i get my guitar and start playing again mm. and uh yeah so that's kind of like the idea where we wanted to go to head it and yeah we met some new friends on the road and they might be uh 
oh, involved in the songwriting. Mm. I don't want to call it a collaboration, but uh, we'll see. It's uh, I'm excited, and I just have to finish one more Ropes song for the new Ropes record, and then I will start like writing the older stuff. Yeah, I, I was going to ask you. I mean, do you feel a sense of invigoration about a follow up to All That Has Never Been True, especially given? like the outpouring of positive sentiment towards that record? Because, I mean, it, it, from the impression I took away from you when we met at ReaperFest, you almost seem to be slightly bowled over by just how much people have embraced it and how much they love it. I always think whatever I do is terrible. And uh, it's uh, to me, it's like I have to write it because I have to write it. I have to get yeah. it off my chest. And especially, like, all that has never been true has been such a like a statement for myself. Because now today, on the 31st of October, uh, well, we have two releases of Ulta today, the one we will speak about in a minute, mm -hmm. but it will also see the reprint of uh, The Inextricable Wandering on Vendetta Records, our third full-length record. And that record, to me, is like a, like a wound that won't heal, because it's like it was born from such a difficult time. And that's kind of like why I've been in a weird mood the last weeks. I've been reminiscing about these times and when Inextricable Wandering came out, it was received very weirdly. It was our first record for Century Media, our only record for Century Media. And we had such positive feedback, but we also had like people that always liked to say like, this is a weird record and it really is. And um, back then when that came out, I was in such a bad place. And then mm. I just tried to end Ulfa. That's what I told you, like when we spoke. And um, then we wrote Belong, the Belong EP. And that like was more in the vein that I wanted to have it. And I'm like, no, I have to finish the trilogy. And it has to be a record that if the band ends now, I'm cool with it. Yeah. And I think all that has never been true is the record. If we would break up now, I wouldn't have any regrets because it's like a flawless record in my opinion still. But now we're on a different page and we're completely free and we don't care about anything. And Vendetta doesn't give us any hassle. We have no aspirations for major labels or whatsoever. So we're completely free to do whatever we want. And I think that's where we float the best as a band. Yeah. Well, Chris was saying when I spoke to him, he, he also mentioned Stefan from Vendetta and, and again, ben, you know, said like he is absolutely, you know, open to any idea that you have. He, he respects that it's your music, it's your art and, you know, that you have free agency to present it however you want, record it however you want, take it wherever you want to take it, which is which is awesome. And as a side note, by the way, on the Belong EP, it is longer than the vast majority of albums that come out <laughs> nowadays. So yeah. even though it is even though it's only two songs. But yeah, uh, so so let's uh let's touch a bit on on the on this new um uh this new uh, author release. It's the it's this the single for Unholy Passion that you recorded. You had uh, Mike doing guest vocals. Uh, two years ago, I believe it was, I I suggested to Mike that Tombs needs to do a, like the way Danzig does, Dan, you know, Danzig sings Elvis or whatever the case may be, like to, to, there could be a Tombs sings Sam Hain. Because I think Sam Hain, I, 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 I'm a fan of Danzig across the piece, so, you know, love Misfits. Love Sam Hain, love Danzig, but I've always felt that Sam <coughs> Hain is kind of the the forgotten of the three. You know, like people un undervalue it when really, you know, every single thing Sam Hain ever put out is um, there's gold on every single one of those releases. So I love the fact that, that you guys have done this, but I, I almost I, I I would love to see almost more of it. But but to, to, to talk to me a bit about how this whole whole thing came to be. I mean, Tomb, Tombs already did a Semain cover before, like even we had the idea to do a Semain cover. And uh, yeah, first of all, before we go into this, I don't want to have uh, Tombs sing Semain. I want to have Mike Hill sings Roy Orbison. <laughs> well, okay, I'm down with that. <laughs> yeah, totally, man. I mean, I, Roy Orbison's like one of my first original favorite singers. And, and like that's... Yeah, Danzig and Roy Orbison are like my vocal inspirations, really, in a lot of ways. You know, even though the the, the register that I work in is a little bit different than Danzig's or Roy's, but they're like, they're you know, lonely guys in black. You know, <coughs> like, pretty much how, how I see myself, you know. 
But you, the, the, the reason I was so keen for you to do the Sam Hain stuff wasn't just to kind of remind people about how cool it was. I, I loved the cover that you did of uh, of the shift, and I, I like part of what I loved about it was like I, I've spoken about covers quite a lot on the podcast. There's there's this thing where bad people, you know, they will redo a song exactly the way the, the original band did it. Then there's people that do their own interpretation. They 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 sing the song in their own voice, and some people change it completely, like Typo Negative did with Black Sabbath, and it's incredible. Some people will will stay relatively close to the source material, but there'll be those those added touches. And I think on the on the shift, you really really nailed that. And so my and immediately when I heard it, I was like, man, imagine what it would sound like if he if he does the howl, or if, imagine if you you know what it would sound like if he does. Um, uh, maybe not all murder or guts or fun, but to walk the night. I mean, I know you and I spoke about that offline. That that that's the song that I would fucking love to hear you do. Um, but um, uh, you know, again, I was super excited when Unholy Passion. You know, you, when when Ralph shared with me that that was happening because it, it's 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 one of my favorite songs that Sam Hay never did. One of my favorite songs, period. And I think the the combination of the two of you doing it together was just absolute magic. Be fun, man. And you know, we performed that. Um, you know, last year, just about a year ago, and um, I was able to come on stage and you know come out for Unholy Passion Festival. Ralph and I got our, our tattoos together, and uh, it was just a great few days spent out in Cologne. And I'd never been to Europe, you know, as like a, a you know a spectator. You know what I mean? Like I've only ever been to Europe to play shows or go on tour or do festivals or whatever. And technically, I guess I. You know, I only did one song, but so I was really more of just like a hangout, you know, relaxation sort of thing. And it was just security on the on the you know when uh, when you're not singing. Yes, yeah, you know, <laughs> security. Yeah, Dude, I made it. I made a joke the other day on a photo of your uh, that you posted of yourself on stage. You you are looking fucking ripped. Have you been uh, like? Is that is that just a good <laughs> angle? Have you been hitting the gym harder? But you looking you looking like seriously swole. I don't lift weights at all, man. I just go to Muay Thai, like, you know, however many days a week I go and I just train and just do push ups and like yeah. punch, punch people in the face, you know, and kick, do head kicks. That's And, and then when, it would, at that point, when do you take the steroids? Oh, I've been taking them all along. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I just, I just, you know me, man. I'm always out. I mean, I, I'm more into martial arts than like lifting weights. I mean, you know, I do push ups and kettlebells, things like that, but I'm not like lifting weights really, you know? Yeah. 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 But um, uh, Ralph, t t turning it back to you. So, so like, what, the, the you guys performed the song. When did the actual recording happen? Uh, after that, um, we um, so first off, because you asked, like, how did this come about? Um, I mean, you know Mike for four years. I think Mike and I we know each other for more than twenty years now at this yeah. point. Um, and uh, throughout the years, I mean, our shared love for the same kind of music was always there. And uh, we already have like an established connection with like being part of a cover version the other band has done. Because um, I think it started when you guys did uh, the David Bowie cover of Heroes. And Mike asked me and said like there will be two versions of that. And the one will feature like the German passage that Bowie sings. And he wanted me to do that. And uh, funnily enough, that was the starting point where I re got reintroduced to Andy, our keeper, who's um, – I was still here? Oh, okay, because it was there. frozen yep. for a second. Um, yeah, um, and Andy, well, Andy and I, like, we go way back, like, from we still lived in southern Germany and we're involved in the Curb Eaters project, and we had, hadn't seen each other for a while but then i ran into him at a concert and spoke and he's like oh i'm recording music i'm like oh dude like i i have to record vocals for a cover version of a friend's song and he's like okay let's do that and that's like where i met andy again so i recorded the german passage for that tunes cover i was part in a video which uh, a friend of a friend recorded me in berlin walking around like a douchebag singing into the camera for the music video yeah. And um, then Planks covered A Forest by The Cure for a split that we did. And I had Mike do guest vocals. And when we started Ulta, I, on the second release, we did the Dismal Ruin CP. I already had like a cover version. We covered Mighty Spinkter. And ever since then, I'm, I, I'm a fan of doing cover versions. But like you said, like some people just played note by note. And that doesn't interest me. I want to make it my no. own thing. 
we because a cult nation asked us to do a cover of Bathory when they did like a Bathory tribute sampler and uh, it was only allowed to be songs from the first record and i'm like i Ulthar cannot play a song in the vein that the first Bathory record sounds and they were like no do whatever with it what that you want and i think the the version of um uh what's that song called wake the dead no no, I think Wake the Dead. Uh, it's more like an emperor song. It's like mm. th th three times the speed of the original song, has like keyboards and everything. And so we did Bathory cover, we did the Mighty Sphincter thing. And then friends and I, uh, like friends of ours, Morast from Germany, um, we started doing split seven inches. They like, also recorded a Bathory song for that split. So we released like the two Bathory covers as a seven inch. Late, years later, we did the same thing with Fields of the Nephilim. And uh, we were like, oh, this is like a fun thing to do like seven inch releases where you have like two songs with different bands now. And then we got uh, friends with Karloff. That it's a new, relatively new, fresh band from Northern Germany. And they're like in that vein of like early Hellhammer and uh, also like this punkish black metal and they're like uh if turbo negro was possessed by satan pretty much kind of like that vein yeah <clears throat> and we asked them to do a split and and they were like oh yeah what are we going to do and they're like yeah sam hayne they're like oh yeah fuck yeah and that's where we said like all right now i we have the festival called unholy passion i dj as like unholy passion mike and i segments on everything when black are mostly called unholy passion yeah. we've got the tattoo so now we need to nail it down and record this fucking song and so we practice it did rehearsal demos send it to mike so he can practice the vocals he flew over we like played it two or three times in the rehearsal space played it live and after this we recorded the major structure of the song sent it to mike and he recorded vocals in the States. He sent it back and he layered it in and we did some backing vocals on several parts and yeah, that's about what happened. Let me ask you a question. You guys have known each other for a long time and you clearly have a great, I mean, you're great friends and you have a great creative synergy, a, a great creative connection. How come you haven't done something more no. substantial together? Like, uh, a, you know, your own <laughs> band, your own, you know, your own, you know, what, 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 whatever. Uh, Ralph, I'll, I'll let you take this, Ralph. I was about to say, Ralph, Ralph put his head in his uh, hands there for a second. <laughs> oh, it's... <laughs> big picture is frozen. I cannot talk anymore. Um, yeah, I'm a douchebag. And also, like, I'm just too dumb to operate a computer. That's that's why. I always think, I always think like, yeah, I need to figure out how this home recording shit is supposed to go. Mm. And I, I'm still sitting here, like, putting my iPhone on, pressing the record button for the video camera, play like a riff, then I play it back so I remember how it goes, play like the second riff, kind of like the Burzum live videos that Vark did when he pushed his guitar against the against his table so you could mm. hear it. Do you know these videos? I don't think I ever saw any of that shit. I, I saw, oh, I mean, dude. unless it's on Julian <laughs> perspective, I, 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 I didn't see it. It, it was. It was back when it came out. It was so hilarious. It was, yeah. Mike, do you know them? These videos? Oh, yeah, definitely, yeah. 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 It was like Vark sitting in like an office, like in his home office in France. And he has like this cheap ass Tokai guitar. He doesn't have like a cabinet or an amp. So he says like, and he always had like in comic sense, like these little tiny captions that said like, since I don't have an amplifier, I will push the guitar against the table so you can hear the guitar better. And then he just like plays like the riff for uh, Jesus Toad. Mm -hmm. And it's like, here's the second melody. And he's like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, I saw the thing where he was, I saw like a video where he was like sitting back with his acoustic guitar and he did like an acoustic version of, uh, what's the name of Dunkelite? And he was like, you know, just kind of half singing along to the song. But I, I thought that was just him fucking about. Was that his, his idea of a live show? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he pushed it as live. I mean, that was the yeah. the time when he was he tried to be funny. When he yeah. posted like a collage of him and Mayhem, like early footage, it's like like next year live Mayhem and Burzum on tour, and like Mayhem like texted him like, "Are you crazy? Shut the fuck up!" And he was like trolling people on the internet. Um, yeah, but like getting back to where we're at, like I'm not even better than he is. Like I have no idea how to record music on the computer. And uh, yeah, that's the main reason. And aside from Mike 
like Mike never wants to move to Germany. So <laughs> you, 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 you haven't been tempted to move to Europe, Mike. Don't say, don't say never, man. You know, you never know. <laughs> yeah. But uh, no, we should get together either here or in Germany for like a week and just make yeah. a record. You know what I mean? That would yeah. be awesome if we did something like that. Yeah. Like put like a time constraint on it. Yeah. We need to do some demos, but it will happen eventually. But like, as I always say, I'm, I'm always like stressed out with shit. But um, yeah, I had like another meltdown in school and like I have to quit this fucking job. Like it, it's taking too much time and energy. Um, yeah, we will get around to this and Jackie, you'll be the first to hear it. Promise. Good. Good. So one of the things we said at the outset of this conversation is there was going to be some Danzig worship here. One thing I was thinking about today, that, like Danzig is quite a, I don't think it, I wouldn't call it him in a quiet taste, but I, I, people I've known throughout my life, they either genuinely like adore everything that he's done, or they just fucking hate him. They just don't, they just don't get it. I do find it interesting that every single one of the horsemen is like a Danzig obsessive. I mean, and it, it wasn't just discussed beforehand. Like you know, barrier to entry is if you're are you a Danzig fan? That's the password is yes. If not, fuck off, kind of thing. But um, yeah, every single one of us is a Danzig fan. And then the other thing is, considering how much we've spoken about him on the podcast, I kind of feel like in some ways he almost owes it to us to, to turn up as a guest on one of our shows. But that being said, like Mike, maybe starting with you, like how did you get into, how did you discover uh, Danzig's music? Well, it's just, just uh, regionally, like I grew up in the New York, New Jersey area. So every single person loves Danzig out here. Even if you're not, yeah. it's like Dan, there's like a pizza place in Lodi, New Jersey. That's like filled with Danzig memorabilia that like, people go there and there's like misfit stuff and all this. Everyone loves them, loves Danzig, specifically Glenn and the misfits. But for me back when, you know, I was a huge Metallica fan when I was a kid, you know, in the eighties. And uh, I saw Cliff Burton wearing this like really sick, like skull t-shirt. Mm. And of course that was the misfits, uh, you know, skull. I did some research. I found out that, you know, the misfits, Cliff Burton. And then I went out and I bought uh, legacy of brutality and thinking that it was going to be like Metallica, you know, it's going to be some thrash type thing, you know, but um, obviously it's not. But on the other hand, like I mentioned earlier, I touched on this earlier. I was always like into like Roy Orbison and like growing up, I listened to a lot of rockabilly and, you know, croony kind of torch song stuff. And, you know, and even some of the early punk bands that I like, like X and the gun club had those types of elements in their music. So I was still able to, even though it wasn't what I expected, I was still able to appreciate what was going on with um, with Danzig, you know what I mean, and the Misfits. So, uh, so that was an easy thing for me to do, and that's that was my entry level into the band, you know. Mm. And Ralph, for you, uh, I would I would love to say like yeah, it was with Glenn Danzig and the Power and Fury Orchestra, but um, I uh, well, I've never like. Yeah, I, I heard the song the first time today. Do you know that song? Like the, the Power first Fury Orchestra, no. <laughs> yeah. I, I did some like research today. <clears throat> we have to ask Mike if he knows it when he comes back. Yeah. Um it is uh, it's the first thing he recorded after Sam Hain broke up and Rick Rubin got him to do that. It's like it was, was it a Black song. the Black Area. Uh, nah, it was it was recorded? even before that, it was uh it's called a song called You and Me. And it's it's actually like a almost positive love song, and uh, it's um, it's really weird to hear that. It's the first thing he did before he recorded Danzig. Holy oh, shit! Yeah, I, I'm I'm just googling it now, and I can I, I'm picking it up here. I I thought I knew everything there is to know about the man. I've I've never heard about this shit in my entire life. Yeah, that's that's why we why we do research so well. Mike, do you know that one? Yeah, yeah you're talking about the uh, this the film stuff from uh, Lesson Zero. That's like yeah, probably yeah. one of my favorite Danzig songs, actually. Yeah. I I was just like joking that I like I wish I could say like this was my entry level into Danzig, but like uh it wasn't I think the first thing I ever heard was on mixtapes that older guys in my school gave me. I there were misfit songs on there because it was like punk stuff. Yeah. The thing that really made me a fan, and this is so not uh, underground or anything, was seeing the Mother Life video on Headbangers Ball and on 120 Minutes. 
So for me, it was like, it's crazy that he, like, it's a guy that like only few bands could transcend to be on Hutbanger's Ball and 120 Minutes. It was Rollins, it was him, it was Faith No More and these bands. But that live video of Danzig, him in this look with the with the skull belt buckle, mm. having the mic upside down and singing like this, the the way of like I think it was Chuck Biscuit playing drums on that. It set, was like, yeah. like almost almost like standing up. This weird sound, the cra- the gun, like the the crowd going crazy. I'm like, what the fuck is this? And it's like, okay, it says Thrall, Demon Sweat Life. So I went out and I got this EP. So that was my entry into like the whole Danzig thing. And that's why still to this day, is this like one of my one of my favorite releases that Danzig has done. Um, let me just check something real quick. Because I don't want to fuck this up. Oh man. Well, whilst you're whilst you're doing that, I'll, I'll say What's up? Ah, there it is. My my journey to Danzig was actually quite similar to Mike's in that I used to get Thrasher magazine um, when I was a, a young pre- pretend skateboarder, and you know you would see at the back in, in the back pages they would always have like uh, shirts being sold, and you, you'd see Sam Hain shirts, Danzig shirts, Misfits shirts, and they always looked really evil and really cool. And you know, again, this was thought at, at, at the time when I was about probably 12 13 years old so you know i was i was still a little cautious about any anything that was um you know too overtly occult but anyway so then um i i saw metallica wearing uh, danzig t-shirts and things like that and i was like man i have to hear this because there's just something there's just something about it that i that that it sounds to me like i'm going to like it and so on a whim one day i bought how the gods kill um and i i, I didn't immediately know what to make of it but i i knew i i fucking loved it it, it didn't cut you know it didn't fit in with you know the the more sort of pedestrian if we're perfectly honest now pedestrian metal stuff that you could listen to at the time like i was you know this was when i was about 13 14 yeah 13 years old i think so i was into metallica wasp pantera that sort of stuff danzig was something just completely different you know you had that really bluesy um uh, what's some influence on how the gods kill it was slow, but it was also really kind of sinister. And that just started the journey of discovery. For, um, I, I heard the mother, uh, or I saw the mother music video, loved that. Thought that I was buying Thrall Demon, <coughs> but I ended up buying uh, Danzig 4, the, the the record. So I'm like, where is mother on this? But, you know, eventually you forget about it because it's got, you know, uh, Son of the Morning Star. It's got um, I Don't Mind the Pain and just, you know, a ton of incredible songs. Um, and then after getting into that is when I started digging back into the archives and it started with Misfits. But then I, I actually, without having heard the band, I bought uh, a, a box set on eBay of all of the Sam Hain. It was this cool like coffin shaped box that had all of the, the Sam Hain records and like that to me just, it just completely and utterly blew me away. Um, but yeah, that's that, that was my, my journey to Danzig. And I, you know, Carl and I did a deep dive on Soul Knox about Danzig and I I'm maybe one of the few people I know who doesn't even I, I don't like the the Elvis cover uh record, not a big fan of skeletons, but I I can dig on Black Ass the Devil. I fucking love Satan's Child. So even some of the, the 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 more reviled Danzig material I'm properly into. Yeah, how the how the gods kill, I think like one of my all time favorite Danzig songs, Sistinus is on that. And, yeah, um, you know, I'm always partial to his like real croony like songs, and like if I ever get married, Sistinus is going to be playing at my wedding for sure. Such an incredible song. That was a song I used to uh, I used to use to, uh, to to rap to the ladies when I was young. Also, took the lyrics and said to I may have said to a couple of girls in my teen years that it was me that had written the lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> they of course there's no fucking way they're gonna know about Danzig. I mean, it, it was it wasn't particularly widely available in South Africa and definitely not played on the radio. So I could get away with that uh, with that con. But uh, Ralph, you were you were looking up something a second ago. Yeah, yeah. I I, I wanted to know like the first song on Thrall, Demon Sweat Life, which uh, it's coming down because uh, that's still like when I DJ uh, as Unholy Passion, I always like open with that song. And it was one of the first songs that I like practice guitar to because I have to say with like the Danzig stuff, like the bluesy parts, 
I wasn't so hot on them when I was younger. I wanted mm. to have like the rebellious, more punk thing. And that's why I think Sam Hain will always remain my favorite of the three of Danzig's bands. But uh, now I can totally back like the bluesier elements, the croony stuff, and it's great. And also when I saw him live like five years ago, six years ago, I loved it. And uh, But back when I was younger, I'm like, nah, I want like the, you know, like the fist to your face kind of rock music. And it's coming down has like this super aggressive tone to it. And um, <clears throat> so like you, like when four came out at the same time, around the same time that the Mother Life video premiered, I was like super, a super huge fan, <coughs> excuse me. And um, like, like you said, I was the guy that like found stuff on Headbangers Ball. Mm. And um, then I checked the shirts that they were wearing or like, you know, like this guy used to be in that band. I remember like seeing Shelter and like, this is terrible. And that's like, but yeah, someone told me, yeah, that's the singer of Youth of Today. It's like, what the fuck is Youth of Today? And then you start like going back and, and finding this. And when I started digging deep into Danzig and Sam Hain and the Misfits, then all of a sudden I'm like, I had all these Metallica posters in my room because I was a huge fan when I was a kid. I'm like, this fucking skull, that's like from him? Like, oh, mm. Jesus. And then, then I saw like the Danzig skull and that became like even more important to me like the i love the misfit school mask but the like the danzig skull itself is like one of the per most perfect things a band has ever had as logo yeah i agree there is definitely something i i, I don't want to sound cheesy but there's something for me in what it represents like the rebellion and the you know everything i love about heavy music in a, in a, in a weird way and that that really became pronounced when i when i interviewed him for chronicles of chaos he was um, the, the the story about that that I've said on the I've, I have shared it on the podcast before, but just in case you know I haven't said it, I haven't told either of you guys. So uh, when I was still writing for Chronicles of Chaos, you would you know talk to people from magazines and from other websites, and you know invariably the conversation goes to you know who's the biggest asshole you've ever interviewed, and I had a, a couple of folks that I threw in there, and almost everyone to a person was like Glenn Danzig, terrible left the room midway through our interview, put the phone down on me, you know, whatever the case may be. And um, and I spoke to him uh, for well over an hour, hour and a half, and he was just the nicest guy. Like, uh, what, I, what I realized through the conversation was like, I think he, he had just been, even at that point, doing it for such a long time, and he had been asked so many fucking stupid questions that if you were going to, if that was the approach that you were going to take with him, you, you were always going to lose. But if you just let him be and let him talk about stuff he was interested in, he, you know, he, he, he was happy as can be, you know, he was talking to me about, uh, these sessions that he used to be invited to at Johnny Cash's house, where it'd be like Johnny Cash, um, Roy Orbison, Chris Christopherson, and like all these legends just sitting in Johnny Cash's living room singing. Um, and uh, you know, you, you, you could almost sort of visualize it as he was talking about it because you could think, imagine how that must've sounded, you know, these guys that are like the best of the best singing. And he, he was just, he, he's, he's a, he's a great, great dude. And like I said, I, I like the fact that he's very much a guy who has, you know, he's kind of trod his own path no matter what he's been doing. So, you know, whether it's been music or comic books or whatever the case may be, his movie, his movie output, I'm maybe less of a fan of, but uh, as far as music is concerned, and actually the comics too, I'm, I, I, I just love it. But if we talk about like the different bands, so Mike, tell me more about your like the highlights or the high points for you uh, about if we start with Misfits, like what are the stuff that you what, you, what do you like most? What are you drawn to nowadays? Like what, what's your what's your view on Misfits? Well, probably Legacy of Brutality is my favorite by them because, uh, you know, it's got hybrid moment, moments on it. But more importantly to me, like I said, I like the croonier stuff. So American Nightmare and like Come Back are on that record. And then, uh, you know, Skulls on Walk Among Us is like probably one of my favorite songs, maybe top 50 songs. So so those two records really grabbed me. Then I, I didn't get into Sam Hain until after I discovered Danzig, you know, and, and then the Danzig, the first, the first four Danzig records are classics. Like that's like, mm. I do like their other material later. Obviously I own all the records. I always go see Danzig whenever he plays live. I just saw him like last month, you know, down in Atlantic city. Um, 
But, uh, you know, the first two records specifically have all the, the real meaningful songs for me, uh, you know, on them. And um, with the exception of Sestinas being on How the Gods Kill, and that song lyrically is like such a powerful song. And like I said, you know, if I get married, that is going to be center point at my wedding. It's such an intense, powerful song. As long as it's um, I don't, as long as it's not, I don't mind the pain. <laughs> so, no, no, that, that one's definitely not going to be uh, played. Definitely, I, I, I do, I do mind the pain when it comes to emotions. I've, uh, yeah, I do fucking love that song. <laughs> that 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 I'd say is one of my favorite Danzig songs. But when it, when he like misfits, misfits favorites for you, Ralph. Um, definitely American Psycho. All right, so you right, you right. are going to be Definitely ejected right, right. from Go this through. conversation. That's it, end the conversation. American, American Psycho and Famous Monster. <laughs> Man, Glenn sounded amazing on those. Yeah, yeah it's uh, yeah, also <laughs> I also like uh, I like the political stance that 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 this dude has. So fuck Danzig, but like the new guy, he's my guy. Michael, um, no, dude, like uh, to me, it's that <laughs> to me uh, the the entry point was Walk Among Us. Then I had the Evil Life EP, and uh, but I have to say now it's Static Age. I don't know. I gravitate towards the yeah, the more yeah. rowdy stuff that they did, and like I obsess about like these old life videos when they like could barely play, but they were just like all power, and uh, yeah, like uh, I think to me um, it is always the more goth stuff, and so I have to say London Dungeon. Mm -hmm. It's just like this this intro of London Dungeon still like works perfectly for me. It's also with the clash. It's London calling. It has like the same vibe. It is like this foggy, rainy London kind of sound. Um, so uh, hybrid moments is one of my favorite songs. And uh, I think where, where Eagles dare is also something that is always like where I have to raise my fist. Yeah. Mm. No, I, I'm I'm very much with both of you on that. Static Age for me, that that's that's the ultimate. I, the song Static Age. My favorite Misfits song is Come Back by no small stretch. I was so fucking jealous when uh, Mike Scandato was posting about the the show and I and they were playing it. I was like, I don't I don't think up to that point they'd really ever played the song live on any of these these recent shows. But Jesus, what what a track! Like just, <laughs> just then, I mean, uh, he that would have been. Very early eighties, maybe late seventies, that he recorded that, and and he sounded so incredible. And then, teenagers from Mars, amazing. Uh, I love hybrid moments as well. Um, I do like stuff like De uh, Devil Lock to me is very very cool. That's like probably one of the most extreme songs that that Misfits ever recorded. Um, uh, Death comes ripping, fucking fantastic. But uh, if I had to pick one Misfits song to live with. For the rest of my existence, it would absolutely be come back. Uh, I think it's stunning, and I'm with you as well, Ralph. That almost kind of that very heavy cramps influence that that are, that's in some of the, the the those Misfits tracks. It's magic, especially with these voice over it. So if we then progress on to Sam Hain, um, I mean that's where picking favorites becomes a little harder for me because I, I love everything so much. But Mike, your uh, your take on the the Sam Hain trilogy? Well, I remember being in a record store at one point after I'd you know gotten completely into Danzig, and I saw this uh, record by a band called Sam Hain. I saw the Initium album cover, and these guys are like you know covered in blood, and you know, well, this is for me, man. This is exactly the kind. Of, and I looked yeah. on the back, and I was like, oh. It's Glenn Danzig, you know, like this, I was a young kid, you know, so I didn't, you know, it's, it, was, it was a long time ago. There's no internet, you know what I mean? So I'm like, okay, I need, to, I need to get into this right away. So that was like the first record I, I checked out by them and it was different. You know what I mean? There's like the production is different. There, there's like this darkness on that record. That's like, yeah. it's definitely not as fun, quote unquote, as like the Misfits. And it was more of like, maybe at that point in my life, like how I was approaching, you know, like the horror genre of like looking at it as like allegories for like, you know, there was more thought, there was more depth to it. You know what I mean? It was like getting into the occult and sort of ancient religions and things like that and just darkness, you know, and that's, and they looked cool too. They just had like the cool hair and like they're wearing all black and like 
the whole vibe of the band was almost like like if Bauhaus was like a, a punk band, like a super aggressive like punk band. And that was like what drew me in originally with them. And uh, but some of my favorite stuff though is on November's Coming Fire. Fire. Um, you know, I think that record is probably, uh, you know, we have Mother of Mercy on it, Walk the Night, which are like my two favorite Sam Haynes songs. And uh, yeah, to walk this, there's like a fan video of To Walk the Night that cuts in like a Lucio Fulci film. And it, it really captures the vibe of the whole song, like this like kind of vampire, like lonely moonlight sort of vibe. And I think... Mm. That's always that's always kind of been my go-to song with Sam Hain. And of course the shift, which is like about turning into a werewolf, which is like yeah. how awesome is that, you know? Well, the shift is also it's it's one of those songs where I mean you you know the the lyrics by heart because you you you've covered it, but like I'm a I'm a real stickler for someone that can write lyrics in a very rhythmic way, and then you know, like obviously it's 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 about how you express it, now you rec- how you deliver it at the end of the day. But even when you read it, you know, you like you know, then the muscular convulsions tear at your brain, leaving you snarling and snapping at air. Your thoughts of tearing asunder all that exists in a man's world. I mean, it's, that is genius. That's tier one lyric writing. I mean, he that's that's something I I think Glenn doesn't necessarily from outsiders again you either get it or you don't get it like some people write the guy off as is hokey or whatever the case may be but if you get it like he he is to me one of the premier lyric writers no matter what he's writing about uh but but ralph on the uh, topic of sam hain wh- what's your uh, what's your view it's <clears throat> just what mike just said was pretty much like the point why mike and i have been friends for so long because um i'm like the same like i when I knew about Danzig and I discovered the Misfits and then like someone said, yeah, you have to check out Sam Hain. It's his, his other band. So I went to a record store back then and went through the secondhand CD bin. And the first thing I saw was the Initium CD. And I'm like, okay, this is like, this is perfect. And I think if you would like introduce kids to black metal nowadays, and he would say, like, oh, look at these promo photos from all these black metal bands. So you've got here, you've got Emperor, all nice with the axes and the corpse. But yeah, and you've got Mayhem here. And look at this black metal band, Sam Hain, with the initial photo. Nobody would say, like, oh, that's not a black metal band. Because that, that cover artwork is so much, like, peak Norwegian black metal that it's almost ridiculous. And um, then again, it's like it has this super rough punk uh, to it. All murder, all guts, no fun is like a killer song. But yeah. yeah, like the perfection, the perfection is Sam Hain number three, November Coming Fire, because you have Mother of Mercy, you've got to walk the night, let the day begin as a one two punch. And then after that, Halloween, like then the uh, re recorded version, absolutely flawless. And of course, uh, I have to say, Unholy Passion, the song. Which uh, I will predict by the time, by the like, I mean, right now, like the, the 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 waves are going out. People are buying the seven inch now, and uh, it will get like some play and shit. I wonder how long it will take until someone complains that Ulta, the political left wing supremacist Ulta, actually covered a song about fucking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, but is that um, is that that's against? Uh, I mean, that that's you know, how is that a bad thing though? That's you know, misogyny. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's like misogyny. That, you know. Yeah, yeah and in every in every sentence you should have sung like only in consensus, only in consensus. <laughs> <laughs> when you when you printed the lyrics, uh, uh, the like record. like do the like un- unholy passion, and then you whisper underneath like only if it's consensual. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, Mike, I just have to say. I, I, I th- again, I've, I may have mentioned this on the podcast. You said something on the Necromaniacs podcast <coughs> when I was reviewing Wicker Man, and you were talking about how <laughs> it was the way you said it about how Nick Cage is calling the women bitches. I was fucking laughing so hard I had to rack my my weights back up because I nearly dropped the weight on myself. I started laughing so much; <laughs> it just Dude. caught me like from from nowhere. Um, when I, no, when we, let me could let me jump in here. When we posted that video clip of the pressing plant of the seven inch actual actual seven inch of being pressed, we like usually we don't tease releases because we're just like okay, here's the day, it's out now. 
um, Stefano Fendetta sent us that video from the pressing plant, which was so cool because they actually played the song in the background, which nobody like understood that it's like in the pressing plant over the stereo you could hear like the beginning of the Unholy Passion cover. And then at like the seven inch come out with a, with a sticker on it, which had like the Danzig skull, uh, the Sam Haynes skull and this, this Marilyn artwork. And this combination, not a lot of people have that. So we posted it and like some people on, on our Facebook and Instagram were commenting because we just like, I posted a quote of Sam Loomis about Michael Myers in the comments mm -hmm. and just like uh, tagged Mike and Vendetta. So I'm like, I love like these teases and like, I was wondering how people would get it because now they understand because we have this limited uh, Halloween seven inch cover art that only is like sold through us. Um, <clears throat> that's why we released it on October the 31st, which is coincidentally like the day of this podcast. It's all like, it just fell into place. Mm. We posted this video and people underneath were like, uh, like commenting, oh, uh, is there something new coming? Oh, where can I order? Blah, 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 blah. And then one is like, so, ah, oh, yeah. So uh, let, 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 let me do it in a German accent because it's, it's so fucking German. So yes, yes, this underneath this is the skull of the Dan of the Samhain or the Danzig. It's not the Misfits, but then again with the lady on top, that's not a Danzig thing. So it could be Samhain. So maybe it's the Samhain cover split. The next guy comments, "Oh really? Oh, I heard so. I, I don't know what, but I heard terrible things about Danzig. I'm wondering how a band like Ulta could fuck with a guy like Danzig. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, like, I'm dude, surprised. like every every year I post at least like three pictures of Danzig or Samhain, like in preparation of Unholy Passion Fest. I spoke a bit a gazillion times. There are like hundred photos of me playing live with a Samhain T-shirt. I'm like, uh." Yeah, it's like I didn't even yeah, comment. I, I, no I, I one commented you like on your this. own. I, I, I dare you have your own taste in music. Your own, not uh, un, unapproved taste in music. Yeah, it's uh, I'm a terrible human being. Uh, horrific. Um, so yeah, so my obviously I told you guys I got that coffin box with the Sam Hain stuff in. Weirdly enough, I, well, I don't know why I started with November Coming Fire. Got really stuck on that album. Didn't listen to anything else in the box for weeks. Um, and then I got into Initium and everything else. Favorite songs? There's some. There's some parallels. I think "To Walk the Night" is incredible. I think "Let the Day Begin" is incredible. I think "November's Coming Fire" the song is fucking amazing. It's got one of my favorite things in the world, which is uh, well timed, well placed voice noise. And you know when Danzig does his whole ha ha, it's genius. I mean that's fucking. I just love it. Uh, Initium. I mean that just start to finish is masterful. But side B as that record is, is, is recorded. Horribus, The Shift, The Howl, Archangel. I mean, fuck that. Uh, four more. I mean, you'd have to go a long way to find a record that has four more perfect songs consecutively. <coughs> um, it, it's just absolutely fantastic. And then I, I think Final Descent is incredible as well. But I, I think I think November Coming Fire and Initium, um, I mean, you could pick up pick just about anything off that but one thing that i would love on the uh tombs sings sam hain november's fire has to be on there without a doubt um and the the howl that's i'd say my two favorite songs are, are, are probably those two all right i would so probably go with that I, I would probably go with that too i think i we should do that for sure uh, dude, it would it would be so fucking cool if you did did something like that and get like you could you could get some guests like do do something special about it. But I think the the whole like doing the album and then having the the Halloween show, um, you know, like do it somewhere in New Jersey, like somewhere that's that's Danzig, that you know, that's Danzig specific. It'd be fucking awesome. I, I think I think the it is it's due time because the pandemic is over. I think we can agree on that. So maybe twenty twenty four, the uh, Necromaniacs. Halloween party could happen and an all-star cover band could do like a set of Sam Hain and Misfit songs or shit. Just saying. You don't even, and then you don't even have to do a special recording of it. Just, just take the soundboard recording, um, do the, uh, what's name, do the, like mix it properly and stuff like that, or, or, you know, just, 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 just master it properly and release that. I'm doing so then you'd have some of that you you'd have some of that live energy as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But I I've actually been practicing singing Sistinus acoustically. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I have like a version to be playing that, you know, we're working on that. That's something I wanted to do, you know. And uh 
So yeah, I don't know. I think that's a cool uh, idea. We actually planned on doing something like that this year, but we just with the pre-production for the new album, we just didn't have enough time to really get it together and everything. Your, yeah. your brushes with the law, you just you just couldn't quite get there. Running right from the law, you know. <laughs> the okay, let me ask you another question. How uh, uh, so, Sestinas? I know the song extremely well. There's a couple of of really like high you know high pitches that that he reaches on that song how do you find you you cope with that um with your voice well i just like uh i detune i, I like playing in a lower key you know what i mean yeah like um either c or a is like what we tune to and uh so like it drops down what register and i can usually hit that with my voice like i don't you know he's way higher than i am so it's yeah. like that's how i deal with something like that um all right, cool. So let's let's then talk about uh, the Danzig, um, the, the or the you know, actual Danzig, the band, um, you know, and favorites from there. So if you were to go through that, uh, you know, like through through his solo, well, technically solo material, Mike, what, what are your what's your take? What's your favorites? I know you've touched on some of it already. Probably my favorite song is uh, "A Long Way Back from Hell" from Lucifuge. Like the way that song just that record kicks off with that song and that opening riff. That down, 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 it's just so brutal. And then uh, another another great record, another great song off that record is Her Black Wings, which is like, you know, not to sound, you know, I know that we have a very politically aware uh, listenership out there, you know, but that's like kind of like the ultimate like stripper song. I was literally about to say at one point, my understanding is it was it was one of the most popular s songs in strip clubs throughout America. I think so. I mean, I've only you know, I, I, I from what I've read about strip clubs, that <laughs> song has been played quite a bit in the early nineties. You know what I'm saying? So you have a, you have never been to a strip club. I'm not I saying I have. I'm that. not saying I haven't. <laughs> Fair enough. I uh, over here the number one song in strip clubs without a doubt was Black Velvet by Alana Miles it, it, to a point where uh, when I when I may or may not have been a young man in my in my roaring twenties um, there was I was in I was in an establishment one night and I swear to God over the space of three hours they played it nine times and it, was, it, it pissed me off so much eventually I was like fuck it I'm going home <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd rather go watch porn at home than put some if I want to see nakedness then continue to experience <laughs> this fucking song over and over again but um outside of those any any other highlights that come to mind well definitely off of the first one uh you know I mean it sounds it's definitely trite to cite mother but that song rules that's why it's such Amazing. a hit and of course uh you know twist of cane yeah. is like uh, a great song um yeah, like those two are, are real center centerpieces for that record. And just even that first album, for it to come out around that time, because I remember it was 1987 it came out. And, uh, you know, it was in the era of bands playing hard rock. You know, like the cult had made the electric, you know, Guns N' Roses were around. But, like, it's almost like Danzig stepped up and was like, you know what? You guys are all posers. The cult, you guys are a bunch of goths. You're not really rockers. Let me show you guys how to do it. I'm playing yeah. some blues, hard rock. So step off. You know, that's how I felt when I first heard that first Danzig record. There, and there are some savage songs on that first record. Uh, my, yeah. my favorite song of that first album, it, it was Mother, and I absolutely love Twister Kane, but it, uh, over the years, Possession has grown to be probably my favorite song on that, that record. I, like, I've, I started actually seeing them play it live once, and I was like, oh, my God, this is like, I have to go back to the record and, and listen to this again because this is fucking fantastic. But uh, I totally agree with you. It, it, it was a record that when it came out, it was so different to everything else. Um, stood alone, but but really made a statement. Ralph, you're, um, I saw you nodding along when I was saying uh, when I was mentioning possession. Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, I, I could nod to probably almost every song that we're going to name, but possession is a fucking good song. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> to me, I, I would already mentioned it. My entry point and probably my favorite song ever is "It's Coming Down" because it's it's such a banger. And uh, but then like. Um, yeah, I got a fable for the songs with off in the title. So Tired of Being Alive is one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, Twist of Cain, Snakes of Christ, Ropes of Night. Um, 
Oh, oh shit. That's I didn't figure that up. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. uh, do you wear the mask? Dirty Black Summer. And I have such a spot for the fourth record. Um, Got to say, a little whip can't speak. And for until you call on the dark is like one like that's a song for the ages. Yeah, on the fourth album, I would say my favorite songs are um, Dominion, um, Son of the Morning Star. I, I don't mind the pain. I think is is phenomenally good. Yeah. I think Let It Be Captured is really really good. Um, can't speak is fucking great but yeah if i had to pick pick one favorite of it it'd be depending on my mood on the day it'd be a toss-up between dominion and i don't mind the pain um and yeah my, if i went if i if i if i went album by album so danzig 2 my favorite song would be probably and this again is something that has evolved over time 777 i think would probably be my favorite song on that album i just love the way it starts i love the mood that it sets it sounds you know what it reminds me of a little bit you know that that scene where um they go to the, the biker bar um in true detective in season mm -hmm. one it, yeah. it, it has that feeling like something's about to pop off and i i do love that melvin song that they that they play on true detective but that to, to me that that's it captures a similar feeling it's funny um, that when we when we did that episode about True Detective and we posted this, <clears throat> someone in the comments on everything when Black said this is the only unperfect thing in this whole show is that the Melvin song that they play in the bar wasn't released in the time that the show actually takes place. Oh yeah, you're right. Actually, you're right. Because it's a I, cool song though, and yeah. it, 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 it it suits that scene so well. I'm I'm such a sucker for shit like this because like I don't know like I know Mike saw it but did did you see Dark the the German Netflix show No No oh, wow okay you should um and in 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 Dark it plays in a timeline in the 80s in Germany where um there's a like a really famous scene where a, a guy a police officer comes comes in to interview like a young kid and he plays um a creator um with um Damn, oh, why would I have my drawing a blank now? Uh, the one with the devil on the cover. Oh, stupid. Uh, uh, creator record, Flag of Hate. No, 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 no. It's not Flag of Hate. It's, uh, oh, Jesus. Uh, Hold on, I'll tell you in a second. My favorite creator record. Why am why I'm, like, I'm, I'm ill. I, Violent Revolution? No, 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 no. It's an, it's an 80s record. Damn. Um. Sorry. No, 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 no. Worries. Pleasure to kill. Oh, okay, all right. Pleasure to kill. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, like, he plays that record, and like people, like, then googled it and found out that, like, the record actually came out three months before the events of the first dark season. Yeah. And that, and that guy walks into school and has a self-made mayhem T-shirt on, like one that looks like someone hurt mayhem and was like taking like a like a sharpie, a white sharpie. And then we're like, fuck. And it's like the first release of Mayhem was right about that time, but it should be impossible for someone in a suburb in Germany to find out about like a band in Norway that just started. So that's kind of off key, but I love when people are nerdy like this. Yeah. Just as a, just, uh, just as we're, as we're taking a detour, I after, so I, because of the, um, the episode you guys did on true detective, I went back and I rewatched the, uh, the whole season. A lot of absolutely, did. absolutely fantastic. Then I thought to myself, let, let, let's give season two another go. I have to say it's, this is the fourth time I've gone through season two and it is fucking brilliant. I, I, I completely get why the first time it came out, people didn't like it because it was so different to, to season one. But the more I've rewatched it, I think if you give the first two, three episodes, if you give it some time, it, especially when the story starts to pick up momentum, it is absolutely outstanding. Uh, and, it, you know, it's filled with incredible performances, um, you know, a rare, serious outing for Vince Vaughn, but it is, is without a doubt, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a better season than season three. I mean, there's not even a, no no question about it. I what I, I season three was good. I, it is completely wrecked by a terrible ending, like a fucking Disney ending. I, I hated the ending, um, but season two to me is top notch. Yeah, I, I like season two. I've watched it a few times, and I think Vince Vaughn is great in that. I think everyone, all the actors are good. The story's cool, you know. It's uh, but yeah, it, it had the misfortune of coming out as the second season 
and was completely overshadowed by the first season. You know what I mean? Yeah. And the thing is, it's hard not to be overshadowed by the by the first season. You know, like when when you do something that perfect, it's. I, I get why they consciously would have set out not to try and repeat themselves, which in some in some ways I kind of feel they almost they almost said let's 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 dial it back a little bit in terms of the the, the level of departure here from from the original for season three, which I, in my view backfires. But uh, yeah, it's 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 it, it's hard not to I guess not to struggle against something that is that well done. I'm very curious to see what they do with season four. Um, I, I I'm I'm positive, but. It's also 2023. It, it, it's, it seems to me that with the vast majority of entertainment, we kind of had a blip in 2022 where Pearl came out and X came out. And there was, uh, you know, Terrify. There was some really good stuff that was coming out. But this year has been a fucking bust as far as I'm concerned. I, I, I'm looking forward to seeing Killers of the Flower Moon. I'm looking forward to seeing the new David Fincher movie, The Killer. Beyond that, I, I'm, I don't think I'm excited about a single thing. It's Fargo season five. That might be all right. But um, yeah, it's, it's slim pickings right now. There's a film called uh, Where Evil Lurks, which is coming out on Shutter like in another week or so. Oh yeah, I saw the I saw the trailer for that the other day, and that that I, that, that actually looked pretty decent. Yeah, the, the filmmaker um, I forgot his name <coughs> did another film called T- Terrified. Terrified, mm. quite good. That's on Shutter as well, so maybe check that out if it's something that you think is good. Most likely, you'll probably be into his new thing, and it's. I thought Terrified was great, so I'm looking forward to, the, to where evil lurks. Yeah. Um, just, just very quickly wrapping up my yeah, thoughts on Dante. So, so, Satan's Child, absolute masterpiece, and un, uh, underappreciated in my opinion. I love the album, and I also absolutely love Seven 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 Eluciferi. I, 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 again, I know folks have very strong views on Latter Day Danzig, but those two albums, I, I think people overlook. Uh, Illusifera, especially. There's enough. There's enough for old school Danzig fans to get into there. Um, you know, songs like uh, Angel Blake, Black Mass, um, and the first time I ever saw Danzig play, they started with Black Mass. So I, I think I'll always keep that positive connection in uh, in, in my mind. But maybe the, the 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 way to wrap this up, putting Mike Hill on the spot. If this were an episode of Necromaniacs, what would you give Verotica out of five? <laughs> well, this I'm, is I'm where we st- torpedo our chances of ever having <laughs> a show. I'm going to stick with the troll I've been running on everybody. I'm going to give it a five out of five. Man. <laughs> I, refuse to, I refuse to say anything bad about it. I remember, uh, uh, you know, Brandon Geist at Revolver asked me about what I thought thought about when, it, when the movie came out because I ordered it on Blu-ray and everything and. And he, he and his wife, Maya, had went to go see, see it in a theater. And he's like, oh, we saw, like, the Danzig Veronica movie. I was like, it's, it's fucking awesome. What do you mean? Like, great. And I've been I've been playing the straight man on that ever since. So I'm going to give it a five out of five. Ralph, you're a fan? Uh, no. Uh, but uh, – <laughs> I, I have two. I have two notes before we go out. Like that, I wanted to like, which is also involved with like acting. <clears throat> First off, do you know Portlandia? No. Yeah. Oh, no, it's great. Yeah. Yeah. It's a yeah. really, really funny show by Fred Armisen, and uh, I don't forget her name. And she was in Bikini Kill, I think, or like Sleater Kinney. Sleater Kinney, yeah, yeah. Plays in Portland. It's really like if you've ever been to Portland, it's really like Portland. And they play like vampire goths that go to the beach, and then they make they meet Glenn Danzig there. Like, like the actual Glenn Danzig plays like a skit on himself as like a vampire at the beach, and he's really funny, and that's that's awesome. <clears throat> and the other thing, whenever I like, because I I went through all the records, like the Danzig stuff, and I think like because it's called the classic era, then you have the industrial era, and then the modern era. The modern era reeks to me because it all sounds like uh, New Orleans bands. It has like way too chuggy guitars. I don't like that that much, but they're not bad. But <clears throat> when I think about like the industrial era, and that's something that Mike and I have been discussing a whole lot, like what the 90s changed in like hard bands, I always go back to one of my favorite films, which is 8mm, which is <clears throat> exactly right, the time where, where not, the Nine Inch Nails were like the peak thing. And mm-hmm. you had like that on the soundtrack and you have the scene when he goes into the house of the killer and he has like Come to Daddy by Affix Twin playing on the turntable. 
and he has like th I think he has at least two, but I think he has three Danzig posters in his room, and one is one the the, the one that I always crave that I want to have, but you can't get it is the one where Danzig sits on the throne with the rest of the band next to him mm. from the from the second Danzig album. I think it's the inner sleeve. He has that poster and it's so fucking cool. And I was like, when I was in the cinema, I was like, yeah, that's a fucking Danzig poster. And everybody around me is like, who the fuck is Danzig? I'm like, I hate you all. <laughs> well, I, I think uh, Black As The Devil, like I said, there's is, is some great songs on there for me. I think Sacrifice is fantastic. End of Her Blood is genius. Serpentia is brilliant. Come to Silver is excellent. Ashes is fucking phenomenal. Um, again, I never understood why people hated that record. And that's coming from somebody who, you know, it was a it was a big, big difference. I remember hearing it. I, I saw the, the CD for the first time in a place called CD Warehouse in Johannesburg. And I remember listening to it in the shop and it was like, Jesus, this is way different. But I was hooked by Sacrifice because I really liked Prong and I saw Tommy Victor on the on the music video. So I was like, mm, okay, let's let's check out the rest of the record. And it was it took a few lessons to properly settle in, but once it settled in and you could I kind of got the sense of what he was doing, it was like, okay, I'm 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 digging this. I'm I'm down with it. It's, he's one of those people. It's a bit like Paradise Lost. I'm up for doing whatever you want to do as long as it's something, as long as it's authentic to you. Like sometimes I might not like it, but I prefer somebody do something that they were truly convinced about at the time and that they truly felt passionate about at the time, rather than somebody who just goes through the motions and puts out the same old shit every single album. But uh, in any case, uh, my friends, on that uh, on that note, thank you so much for uh, for spending the time with me. It's great to see you both again, and great to see you both doing really well too. Um, uh, Michael Hill, hopefully in twenty twenty four, we're going to be in New York at some point. Uh, it'd be fucking cool to see you. And you know, if you're ever in uh, in the UK, I've now finally gotten to meet Ralph. Realize <coughs> he's substantially taller than I am. Oh, yeah. um, he dwarf he dwarfs me and normally i'm the biggest guy on the on the photo um but uh yeah it'd be, it'd be awesome to finally meet face to face well you know next year like i said we have a, this record coming out so we'll be doing a lot more you know road work and touring and i'm sure we'll be over in europe at some point next year yeah awesome all right guys take care all right gents take care bye bye, -bye. another time Roy jesus was coming home in the evening with joseph he met a boy who ran so hard against him and he threw him down. To whom the Lord Jesus said, If thou hast thrown me down, so shalt thou fall, nor ever rise. At that moment, the boy fell down and died. Jesus. It's pretty funny.
That was a one-two combo that started with Unholy Passion by Ulther, was followed by Let the Day Begin by Karloff, a tribute to Sam Hain that is available right now on Bandcamp. I'll post a link to that in the description to the podcast. Massive thank you as well to Ralph Schmidt and Mike Hill for coming on the show. Make sure you check out their bands and make sure you check out Everything Went Black, um, one of my or two of my fellow horsemen of the podcasting apocalypse, and always an absolute blast having them on Into the Necrosphere. Speaking of the horsemen, I am now welcoming to the show the Reverend Carl Hikara, and I pose the following question. Do you think that it's socially acceptable to go below the speed limit in the passing lane? If so, it's time for you to get to step in, because this is my weekly news rant. Round about for judgment. And hang them where the world can see. So welcome back to Into the Necrosphere, sir. And uh, we're going to get started on metalstorm.net in just a second. But uh, I've been meaning to ask you, you, you have kind of consistently moved to a twice a week schedule now with Solnox, have you not? Uh, yeah, pretty much, it, as, it, at least it, right it, now. It wasn't just a case of you, you'd like built up a big bank of content. You, you Are you going to start doing this consistently now? Yeah, well, it started off with, with having 
too many shows and I still have too many shows. So I'm like making more, making them faster, you know? Yeah. So, uh, so it just works out. So, I mean, as long as, I mean, I can always drop back to one, once a month, once a week if I need to, but, um, kind of like the, the twice a week format and, you know, at least for right now, you know, and you have a lot of like, um, you've got a lot of theme shows. Like you had the, um, what's name? you had, you had that show that you did with, um, with Mike. Um, I'm going to, I'm sure I'm going to fuck up the name. Call Edward Wagner. Um, yeah the author i was about to say I, I, I was i was i was sure i was gonna fuck his name up if i said it. it's like one of those things where you know the name but because you know you're busy recording it it's almost <laughs> a guarantee you're gonna mess it up but yeah I know you had that you've got horror hotel so you've got like a lot of specifically themed stuff so i think the two uh or the the, the, the twice a week schedule actually suits your your approach quite well yeah well that's, that's part of it is that i have a couple monthly episodes and i was just like i i want so that was started out. originally I was just going to have those it was going to be twice a month, twice a week, like twice a month. But then I just ended up with so much stuff that I just was like, you know, just run twice a week. And, and it seems to be working out pretty well. And, you know, like every, don't, everybody, you know, listens just as much. So it's not like I'm like not gaining, not having people listen just because you're listening to uh, two a week. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Brandon was also telling me that you were going to start doing a, a porno series uh, called Weapons of Ass Destruction. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be all about porno. I'm just, I just, just, so we're gonna start getting people messaging. Hey, when's weapons of ass destruction kicking off on Soul Box? Um, yeah, we're gonna do. A, we're gonna. We're gonna talk about. You know, all the. We're gonna do like uh, reviews of porn movies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> spoiler alert that they have sex in this one <laughs> hey by the way um i i touched on the exorcist believer um with mike when he was on the podcast and when people watch this it'll be like you know they, they will have heard that a, a couple of minutes ago yeah and they've just released their their review of that trash on um on necromaniacs they weren't kind to it they were more kind to it than i would have been because i would give it minus five out of five <laughs> but um you you saw it as well what were your thoughts so like you know i guess it, i was going in with extremely low expectations and i ended up um kind of like liking the very first part of it like when they you know up to about when the girls come back yeah and i thought it was kind of interesting setup and stuff like that and it wasn't too bad but then just went to complete shit that second part particularly once ellen bernstein came in i was just like what is this what what is going on <laughs> this movie well i, I think it, mike scandado really nailed it when he said on necromaniacs that they they it feels like they brought her back just to disrespect her and i i spotted that on the uh on the trailer the the, the, the trailer was to me the almost the death blow for that movie like when they when they try and have this wow moment of bringing Ellen Bernstein in and then she's, or Ellen Burstyn, sorry, and she's she's presented basically like Laurie Strode, 90-year-old Laurie Strode. And it's like, this is a completely different character. The psychology of her is completely different. Like maybe if you wanted to bring her in, have her be someone that they go and talk to about her experience. And maybe she's somebody who shows a degree of empathy and says, you know, this is what I did and I understand what you're going through. You could you could make it like a very human moment, but not don't don't try and turn her into something that she absolutely never was and never would be. I mean, you know, ne never mind the idea that in the in the movie she's written a book about her experiences, which she would never ever like the the character that you that you're presented with in Freakin's movie would never do that. It, 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 ever no matter how desperate things got even if the you know acting career was on the skids she's being offered porno and she just says no i, I can't do that <laughs> i'm gonna write a book instead she would she would she would go the adult movie route before she does any sort of you know i don't think she would have done anything exploitative like that yeah well i, I think that it's kind of telling because when they um when they uh she didn't sign on until they actually had, after they started recording the movie making the film so mm. I think the film in a lot of ways was cut and was made in a way that if they didn't get her, it wouldn't affect the movie at all, really. You know, like her scenes are completely kind of useless in a way. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like to, and to bring her and then you do bring her in and then then she's taken out 10 minutes later and then the hospital, the rest of the movie is just. So it's probably because she didn't want to be in it for more than 10 minutes. So they're like, okay, what do we do? You know what I mean? Like, She's like, look, you know, I need to leave something behind with the grandkids. So just pay me a bunch of, a heap of money. Because she's, I think she's 90 years old at this stage. 
Um, so yeah, just pay me a heap of money and let me get let me be done with this bullshit. Um, yeah. So I think <clears throat> I do think that there was the like the setup was interesting, but I I feel like if you had taken the setup in a different direction, it could have been a good movie. But because of the way they took it, it just went to. It just was a confused mess. You know what I mean? Like, like I think what yeah. would have been interesting is like what Mike Hill was saying on their episode of Necromaniacs, where he's like, well, what, what he wanted to see was them take like the the demons, like this ancient evil, and the Christian stuff is just an overlay onto it. You know what I mean? And kind of explore that kind of side of it, of which is kind of, I feel like they're trying to go for presenting it as this ancient evil, but then. You know, they you didn't they didn't really explore the the demon itself very much in the movie to the point that the demon's not even the same demon as in the first movie. Yeah. But they don't but you don't know that when you watch the movie. You have no idea. I just didn't figure it out until later on. You know, like it just it's just a it's just a mess, you know, like really well, and it, I th I think the other thing that it that it does that's absolutely ridiculous is it 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 throws out now this it doesn't really matter what side of the spiritual aisle you're on yet you you can't throw out the entire rules of the game right and the the rules of the exorcist is it's a, it's a catholic movie it doesn't matter what anyone thinks it's written by a catholic a guy who was studying to be a catholic priest it's a catholic movie it's written in a, it the, the the whole construct of the of the film hinges around the catholic faith and around somebody's crisis with a with a with a catholic faith so you can't then say, you know, t turn it into The Exorcist, The God Squad, <laughs> which is what they should have right. called it. Like, well, you know, when she says in the trailer, you're going to need them all. It's like, oh, my fucking God. Yeah, I didn't I didn't like how they had like a bunch of people. And then, I mean, but the thing is, even Exorcist 3 is not 100% a Catholic movie. So there are ways to go about it because the main character in yeah. Exorcist 3 is Jewish, you know, so it's like... Yeah, yeah. And if you read Legion, the book, he's like, you know, very, it's very much coming from this Jewish mind frame, mindset of, and that kind of exploration of evil that, that uh, Judaism has in particular. Mm -hmm. So, like, I think that the main underlying concept behind what Blady had for the exorcist is an exploration of evil, right? And in different ways. So you have the Catholic way, and then you have this other book that's kind of about the Jewish. So you could, you could, I don't know if it necessarily needs to be Catholic, but it does like need to have some type of exploration of evil, which we don't really see in the movie. It's just kind of like mm. these girls are taken for some reason. Why? We don't know. The, and then, you know, the whole thing like just kind of feels like um, pointless in a way by the end. Like we, we, you know, no one's learned anything really, you know, no one's had any type of experience where they've like, um, um, had to come face to face with with evil in the same way like when you watch the exorcist the first movie you have these the kind of conversation between Marin and and Karis on the on the on the stairs where they're talking about why and they're talking about you know all that stuff i don't really feel like we get much of that in this in, the, in this movie i feel like they didn't quite understand what Blady had was going for with his with his work. Well, Mark you know Kermode I mean? said that in his review and i thought that was spot on too he's like this is a movie made by people that didn't understand the movie they didn't understand the first one. The the thing for me is it it's it underscores my point that I've always made. If it's if it if it can't star Jason Miller, which it can't ever do again, it's not an Exorcist movie. It should never be made. And as far <laughs> as I'm concerned, if I took over the world, whoever was responsible for the for Believer would be jailed. <laughs> so that's the first thing I do. Like, oh hey guys, you know he's been sworn into uh, sworn into the government. All right, David Gordon Green. Unfortunately, I really enjoy the righteous gemstones, but uh, you and everybody were involved in this fucking mess. You're going to prison. You off to the gulags. <laughs> All right, let's listen to some music. So uh, the first headline: Manticora, Beast of the Fall, single unleashed. Uh, it says here, Beast of the Fall, the first single from Manticora's forthcoming studio record, is out now and available for streaming together with an official video. The new outing is ready to be released in early 2024 by Mighty Music. No idea who Mighty Music are. I know that Manticora have been going since 1996, so they've got a they've got a fair or well, tenure. I was I was going to use the word pedigree, but I don't really know because I'm not really familiar with any of their music. I know their last uh, couple of records scored very highly on Metal Archives. Uh, so let's see what uh, what the taste on Metal Archives is, uh, or if it's all it's cracked up to be. Yeah.
Thumbs down. <laughs> <laughs> I think the, that, that opening riff wasn't too terrible. Um, but <laughs> as soon as that lead kicked in, I, I knew we were in for something that was going to be shite. They, like, we've got our episode of Nevermore uh, Worship coming out pretty soon. Um, and the one thing about Nevermore, it, it, when I hear a band like this, it reminds me of how great that band is. Because Jeff Loomis could get away with a, with starting a song with, you know, crazy lead. and you know, But he's probably like one of the only people that can do it. At least for my tastes. I'm, I'm, I know there'll be people that are big fans of power metal they'll go that sounds great listen to the riff the riff isn't bad but yeah the it, it's it's just not it, it this is one of those things where I, I i can see i can see why the people that rated it highly on metal archives would have done so if this is your thing then you're gonna like it but i don't like fantasy i don't like i uh, actually borderline dislike science fiction in in uh what's name in uh metal music and i don't like power metal really at all it, it's a very very rare occasion where a band like this is going to impress me at all i only like fantasy if it's like dark and evil like you know in black metal terms you know what i mean like if you're doing like you know like in the night side eclipse kind of has a little fantasy yeah, quality yeah, yeah. to the cover but but i what i really hate is like this type of stuff that's like Let's let's go, um, you know. Let's pull on our swords and go fight some dragons. Type of power yeah. metal fantasy that's, that's, stuff, and that's yeah. why, what, yeah. I, what I mean by fantasy. I mean Lovecraft yeah. is fantasy, but that's different. That's horror fantasy. That's that, like that, horror, that, yeah. That, that, I'm, that I'm done down with. But yeah, it's some Dungeons and Dragons shit. It's it doesn't do anything for me. And also, you know, there's a a, a good band called Manticore from the United States who's like really brutal, you know, black death metal. So you know, I'm not gonna, you know. Manticora doesn't doesn't cut it. <laughs> no. Now I, I I will say as well as I mentioned there about fantasy. I, I'm sure that people will immediately say, but you love a bunch of bands that are you know overt Tolkien worshippers. That's also different. Gorgoroth well, and Burzum and bands like that. They're always going to get a pass as far as, far yeah. as I'm concerned. Well, that's what I mean. There, it's like black metal. You know, still evil. It's not. It's not all about like uh, that kind of lame power metal like type of. Yeah, Blind like gl- like stuff. like glory hammer kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, next headline: Nile introduced their new touring lineup. It says here, technical death metal masters Nile have revealed a new touring lineup. I specifically wanted to mention this because of one part of this announcement that I think is very cool. Uh, it says here, the band is pleased to welcome Dan Vadim Von of Morbid Angel and Incantation on bass and vocals, and Zach Jetter of Hideous Divinity and Olkoth. I know you're oh, a cool. big fan of that Olkoth album. Um, yeah. I really like it as well, and I think it's fucking cool that he's gotten an opportunity to play in a band that is this big and that is this prolific. Well, I mean, probably he was releasing that Olkoth album. Probably Carl Sanders is like, oh, this is fucking good. So that's because they're both in this, in the Carolinas. So you know, they're probably like, let's go, let's go recruit this guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Interesting that it's a touring lineup because um, I don't know why he's not included them on recording the record. Um, it would have been quite. I mean, I, I I like I like the 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 vibe on the Nile records where you've got like multiple vocalists and you know you sort of have those dueling vocals, especially when he's doing the, when they're doing those crazy sort of you know Egyptian chants and things like that. I, I think that's very very cool. So if if he's saying that it's their touring lineup, that suggests to me that on this record that they've uh, rec- or that they've recorded now, um, they don't. These guys aren't performing. It's it 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 seems like it may well just be Cole and. Um, uh, what's name in the drama and George? I don't know. I mean, it, I don't know. I don't know what's going on with Nile. Maybe they had other band members and people left, and then they're like, had to get new people for this for the next tour. You know what I mean? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I I really liked um, Brad Paris, who they had before as their. Uh, I thought he was a good front man. I mean, he's not as cool as uh, the dude. Who's, what's what's the name of the guy that they had when they did uh, Black Seeds of Vengeance? Oh, the um, the, the Chief Spires. He was, he was such a fucking like formidable force when he was on stage. He had like you know he was like muscled up. He had this real like warriors vibe to him, and they would have you know the the crazy like warring orchestral music playing in between songs, and you know he's just yelling and shouting at the audience. It just yeah. it just created like such a cool vibe to me. I don't know. I, I don't even know why he left the band. I, I'm sure there was some sort of fallout. I like Dallas too. 
Yeah, um, I, that was my favorite era of Nile. It's basically from amongst the catacombs up to in their dark enshrines. Yeah, my favorite. And that's not saying the rest of the stuff's bad. It's just like that's my favorite era, and that's probably because that was the era of Nile. You know, I think the first Nile album I heard was in their dark enshrines, so it's kind of like that's kind of like uh, those first three albums are kind of like my my. Uh, you know, I have a lot of nostalgia for those albums. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I got into them on amongst the catacombs of Nefron Car, so I've been I've been down with them since the beginning. And I I think I got into them because Eric Rutan in an interview mentioned how great they were. It was kind of how I got into Origin as well. Uh, but I've I've really enjoyed more or less everything Nile has done. And I thought Vile Nolotic Rites, uh, their last album, I, I thought that was one of their best ever. Yeah. I think uh, what should not be unearthed was maybe a little bit of a step down, uh, as was at the gate of Setu. It, they they sounded a little like the band were on autopilot, but Valnalotic Rights was fucking absolutely sensational. Yeah, that was killer. And one thing that I always about Nile back even back to their early demos is always had those kind of neurosis shouty vocals as well yeah. mixed in with the death metal vocals, and I just love that. I love it when when. Because it really gives it that barbaric, like ancient Egyptian feel. All of a sudden, you got some dude like you know, like shouting like manly vocals and parts. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, I'm a big fan of shouty manly vocals. All right, let's hear uh, the Verathon single. I was about to say, I, I knew you would want to hear this. So Verathon uh, are previewing their upcoming album, The Crimson Temple, with a new single called Hegemony of Chaos. The new outing drops uh, on December the first via Agonia Records. Um, yeah. You've been very excited about this. The artwork is fucking killer. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Verathon too. I mean, our last album was pretty good, so you know. I mean, my favorite Verathon is always going to be His Majesty of the Swamp and and while Purgis not, but you know they got they're, they're they've stayed pretty good, you know. But um, I'm interested to see what this one's going to sound because I haven't heard this yet. So let's... well, this is the first like full length they've done since 2018, so it's been five five years. Yeah. So they've certainly had time to write, but uh, yeah, right. Let's uh, let's hear what Hegemony of Chaos sounds like. Let's see if it's any good. So far, I think it's pretty good. I mean, it definitely has that the cl- Greek black metal feeling. It feels in yeah. in line with their post His Majesty Swamp stuff, which has more blast beats and stuff. And uh, I like the kind of old school vibe of the vocals. It's not like blowing me away or anything, but it's not bad. I probably have to listen to the whole song and like you know probably hear the whole album before I make my final judgment on the album. It, you know, so I'm not like blown away, but I also don't hate it. You know what I mean? Well, we'll listen to another sixty seconds in a in a bit. But I, uh, there's a couple of things I really like about this. I think the, I think the use of the keyboard has got a very like old school way that they're using keyboards there. I love this. I love that. I love that sound. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm I'm a I I dig the 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 Greek vibe to it. it. It has a real you know you can hear this is a this this band is out of Greece like you yeah know, they're, 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 it's very like Greek. The, <laughs> it's the it's the fucking sibling of Rotten Christ without a shadow of a doubt like yeah you, you know thy mighty contract era Rotten Christ. It really um, does does have a quality to it that reminds me of old uh, Rotten Christ. Do you know what I mean? Well, question for you. So when it comes to like the elite of the elite greek metal bands um who is your who is your favorite um yeah so my favorite is gonna be and also i was just gonna say for everybody who's into greek black metal i just ordered a book called rights of the abyss it's from heavy metal artwork and it's all about the greek black metal scene 
So I, I ordered that. So just just to, so I want to pull that up and tell people because it looks really cool. Yeah. But um, uh, yeah, my favorite. I'm a big fan of the first of Thou Art Lord, um, uh, Riding Christ, and Verathon. Those are probably my top three. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I do like Necromantia, but I actually like Thou Art Lord more personally. You know, like you know, as much as I like Necromantia, it's, it's probably one of the ones I go to the least out of the, the core Greek black metal bands. You know, and then Septic yeah. Flesh as well. You know. Yeah, Septic Flesh. I like. I, I, I think what Septic Flesh do is absolutely like musically it is incredible um it doesn't yeah. it doesn't always give me the same rush that rotting christ does like rotting christ at their best and for me especially that that series of records that they made you know that were all you know had, had the greek titles felt like you were in the midst of a spartan war like uh, you know aelo and records like that i, I just I, I love those albums i love those albums i love the feeling that it gives me like the atmosphere that it creates when you listen to it and I, and I, you know of course i also really love stuff like trial key of the lost lovers um septic flesh doesn't quite create that to me but i, I do like like their stuff very yeah. very very I, much i'm a big fan of septic flesh i mean uh I like all of the, all of their stuff too. I mean, their early stuff has a particular magic about it. And then, probably my favorite Seventy Flesh album is actually the Great Mass. That's my favorite album. So, yeah. And then uh, yeah, and I also really love very very early Riding Christ. If you go back to their demos and then the Passage Arcturo EP, all yeah. that stuff's really great too. Yeah. Well, there's also a lot of uh, new bands coming out of Greece that are excellent. I mean, I've, I've had Vothrosh on here and pushed that album a lot. I, I still think that'll be a that'll be almost certain contender for the top thirty this year. I think that that album is fucking sensational. Um, but, uh, anyways, let's uh, let's go back and give this another sixty seconds. So I'm splitting two on what I just heard. That first part of the, you know, of that breakdown, that mid-tempo piece, it sick, reminds yeah. me a little bit of um, <laughs> something off Under the Moon spell, which is which is no bad thing because I really like that record. So yeah. I love that part. W whatever that <laughs> instrument is that they just brought in now, I, I may have, I, I like, I get why they included it, but but I may have, as a producer, I would have said let's. Let's keep that one for the archives, friends. Let's <laughs> let's, let's yeah. release a second version of the song that has that bit in. But maybe for the maybe for the album, we kick, we we leave it out. Yeah, I, I'm with you on that. That that first part, I was like, oh man, this is awesome. I really like this mid pace. And then yeah. all of a sudden, we're getting like some weird like medieval piece. Or I was like, I mean, I can live with it, but it's not my favorite. But you know, I mean, it's not too bad overall. And I'm definitely looking forward to hearing the whole album. You know, like and like I said, anybody should go check out the. They had um, Paolo. Uh, What's his name? The, guy, the artist, he did uh, paintings for every song. So there's like some really sick paintings for that album. Well, I agree with you. The cover looks fa absolutely fantastic. But um, yeah, man, it's, uh, it's, it's tough releasing music in 2023. It, it, you're, you are stepping out into some extraordinarily heavy traffic, including by bands who have, you know, who aren't even signed. Um, yeah. You know, like, obviously, we just listened to two minutes of that song. It's unfair to to make a... Uh, to make a direct comparison, but if I were to say what the first what the first two minutes of the new Drugoth did for me versus that, or the first two minutes of the new Sick did for me versus that, both unsigned bands, it's not comparable. Yeah, I mean the Marathon is, is definitely not in running for. I mean, I can already tell probably from that 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 it's not going to be in the top running for like the top twenty, maybe not even top thirty, but um, you know, it's still not bad. You know what I mean? 
it's like something I'll listen to for sure. Yeah. And, I, and I'll, I'll reserve my final judgment until we get the whole album, but it definitely didn't like set me on fire in the same way some stuff does, you know? Yeah. All right. Uh, Sepulchral Curse, uh, they've got a new studio album out or coming out called Abhorrent Dimensions. Uh, they say, yeah, it's ready to be unleashed tomorrow. So I'm assuming, yeah, this goes back to Thursday. Uh, it says, yeah, today the Black and Death Metal Ensemble offering listening the entire music output. I haven't actually listened to this yet, but uh, they're on Transcending Obscurity Records. So that's typically an indication that it might be good. So uh, let's hear what it sounds like. pretty good that is absolutely badass and it, it, like, right where i said where i thought to myself okay it would be good if they could mix up the vocals a little bit now when he hear some different you know when he hear some different pitches yeah some shouts or some screams or something you know those backing vocals it. come in and that sounds absolutely killer and when those those backing vocals come in and you've got that onward the legion part that they that they sing together that is just badass from bell to bell yeah that's good the only Pretty much the only criticism I, I would have is that the guitars are a little a little quiet, but it doesn't really matter too much. You can still kinda of tell what's going on. But I mean this is pretty this is pretty killer. I really like the the it's kinda of got that that kind of grimy, um borderline B steel black metal type of thing going on, but it's death metal. Yeah. It's crazy it, to me how many good uh, death metal bands are coming out of Finland right now, man. The, 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 for whatever reason, I don't know if it's colder than usual or what's going on, but <laughs> fuck, there are so, so many cool uh, cool death metal bands uh, putting out stuff there. And like new bands, you know, bands you've, you've not heard of before, and they're just releasing top, top tier stuff. Uh, well, Devenial Verdict, uh, De Verdict, Verdict, sorry, uh, last verdict. year, they, they, they released verdict. something actually. <laughs> yeah, Verdict, <laughs> it's, it's all the porno talk of earlier, um, but yeah, so Devenial Verdict, I mean, they released something absolutely sensational last year, that Ash Blind album, I know they're going to put out one again next year, um, yeah, man, there's just one great band after the other. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, last year you had Desolate Shrine and you have bands of like Crips and stuff like uh, there's a lot of great stuff coming out of, of Finland in general, but definitely a lot of black death metal. And I mean, you go back to the early 90s, you had, there's a lot of great death metal from ni 90s Finland that kind of got forgotten for a while, which I think maybe part of the rise of newer Finnish bands is probably guys in their 20s or whatever are discovering like, you know, a lot of the old, uh, old Finnish death metal from the early late 80s, early 90s, I'd imagine, well, you, you know. Do you remember a band from Finland called Incision? Uh, yeah, I've, I remember hearing about them. Actually, no, you know what? I am wrong. I, for some bizarre reason, I thought they were from... I thought they were from Finland, but I'm just having... Sorry, I'm just having a look now, and it looks like that may not be the case. I don't... Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure about Incision. I have not the name, but... Like, <coughs> but you have bands like Purulence per, per, and... You know, the Abhorrence stuff that turned into Amorphous and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, no, I think I might be wrong. It looks like they were, uh, it looks like they may have been from, uh, what's him, from Sweden. I'm going to, I'm going to look into that because I remember, I remember when that band came out, they, everyone fucking shat themselves because it was a, you know, just insanely brutal band. Then you, then you had all the bands like Demigod and uh, Demolik and stuff like that from Finland as well, which were really yeah. great. So you know, I think it's just bands going back to the back to the well in there in Finland and coming out with some brutal shit, you know. Yeah, big time. All right, let's give this another sixty seconds.
Yeah, I like that. That gets to, maybe doesn't doesn't quite reach top notch status, but it definitely but gets it, a thumbs up. It's definitely a thumbs up. I really I like that. I like that when it kind of slowed down, then you had the double bass coming in and all stuff. That was really cool. I'm definitely gonna yeah. give this album a listen. Yeah, That's for, for sure. sure. By the way, that Incision album, so they were from Sweden. I was wrong. They were, I don't know why I thought they were from Finland, but uh, the, the record of theirs that is well worth checking out if people haven't done so for a while is Revealed and Worshipped. Uh, I remember when that came out, I fucking loved it. Um, right, speaking of bands that I love, uh, I'm going to head over to YouTube to hear this because for whatever reason, when I play anything off Bandcamp, it uh, deafens people. So... Um, Hold on, hold on. Job for a cowboy. Uh, moon, is it Moon Healer? Yeah. All right, so the headline here reads, Job for a cowboy detail upcoming studio album. It says here on February the 23rd, 2024, US death metal machine Job for a cowboy will unleash their first studio album in 10 years, dubbed Moon Healer. The long-awaited new, uh, new full-length is comprised of eight tracks, along with disclosed details. You can give a listen to the second advanced track, The Forever Rot, uh, via the Bandcamp player. Uh, are you a fan of Job for a Cowboy? Not really. I never never, never listened to them. So, this will be... Uh, how, be how, the... how so? And that I, I just never listened to them. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, like they were, they were, you know, one of those core MySpace metalcore bands. Band. <laughs> you're, you're, well, you're, you're scared to well, reveal your elitist. Uh, elitist <laughs> yeah, well, reverend. well, well, I mean, I've listened to plenty of those kind of bands, but yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, only, I'm only teasing the, you. I know, I know, I know the, you're not an elitist. But the uh, the name always put me off because the name's stupid, like in a way that just never made me want to check it out because like job for a cowboy what the fuck does that mean you know what i mean <laughs> so yeah. i just never listened to them but i know that they're i have heard from people that they're a good band so I, yeah i mean I'll, yeah, let's dude, give them a shot. I, I i think they are absolutely fucking sensational um especially the, the the last record they put out so they put out an album in 2014 called sun eater which is phenomenal um and everything so the the agony seeping storm was the first single they put off of this which i thought was fantastic um i have very good feeling about what this new single is going to sound like as well but i'm i'm now especially curious to hear what you think given that you were <laughs> a pre, pre, that you were a doubter before so quiet for some reason it's because it's building up the the the, the 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 tension is piling on to get you ready for when the blast kicks in So there's there's a couple of things that I'm a big fan of. One of them is being able to very clearly hear the bass in, uh, especially death metal. Another is fretless bass when it is played as exceptionally well as Nick from Cephalic Carnage done or does. And wouldn't you know it, he is also a member of this band and absolutely rips on that song. That riff is fucking awesome. The vocals are badass. Love it. I absolutely fucking love it. Yeah, the bass kind of reminds me of like Steve DiGiorgio or something like that. You know, yeah. Like that kind of that kind of fretless bass stuff. What it's are your What are your thoughts on the song? It's okay. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I was I, I was hoping we were going to get capture a viral moment here. You know, the moment when Jackie um, convinces Carl about the genius of Job for a Cowboy. Yeah, I mean, I don't I don't hate it. Um, yeah, it's it's pretty it's interesting. You know, like 
I'd have to, it's something that I have need to probably listen to more and like listen to the whole album when it comes out and stuff like that to really get a feel for the whole thing. But I like it so far. It's not, right. it's not my favorite thing I ever heard, but I like it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's give it 60 more seconds. Let's, let's see. Let's see if they can do, do some more in 60 seconds to convince you. <laughs> Big fan, yeah. very, like, very, very big fan. I like it more as it goes on. Like it's one of those songs where I'd probably listen to the whole thing and then, you know, like where it makes me want to listen to the whole thing. You know what I mean? Like yeah. hearing now is kind of like makes you want to like listen to the whole song and see how it progresses because you know you don't really know where it's going exactly. You know what I mean? Well, do yourself a favor and check out Sun Eater, their their yeah. previous album, because I think. I think Sun Eater, it, I know it turned a lot of people's attention to the fact that this band was, you know, anything but a flash in the pan, MySpace, you know, Suicide Silence type band. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I think they're, the, they're, problem, they're... the problem was back in the early 2000s, I kind of associated them with like um, August Burns Red and, you, you know, yeah. all those types of those types of bands. And um, but I know that that's not where you know from i know that they went more in the real death metal direction and you know kind of like how cattle decapitation did and so it's like i've always known that i need to check them out but i just haven't got around to it you know there's a like and just because you know i'm not a big fan of like august burns red and suicide silence those types of stuff but there are some of those types of bands that are okay too but this all depends like some of those deathcore bands are okay you know like i'm not gonna like completely just like go oh, no i don't like it because it's one of those bands you know what i mean like yeah and even well, like some of I mean, I, I, I get, you know? I get where you're coming from, though, because I, I don't like August Burns Red. I hate Suicide Silence. Um, you know, and it's, it's maybe like a lot of the melodic death metal bands. I'm, a, I'm a li I am a little bit like that with um, deathcore stuff as well. I just have sort of a, I have a bit of a prejudice towards it. It's just when I, I see a certain type of name, I see a band representing themselves in a certain way. I just think, fuck it, it's not going to be for me. Yeah. I have had quite. A, you know, quite a few surprises, including on the news rant uh, when it comes to bands like that. But um, Job for a Cowboy, I think I got into specifically because I was sent a promo, I think for Ruination, and I was like, fuck it, this sounds way better than I thought it was going to sound. Uh, and yeah. then, uh, Demonocracy came out next, which was also excellent. And then Sun Eater came out, and that was a, a you know, that was a triumph. So Yeah, because I know at this point, Job for a Cowboy are pretty much legitimate death metal band kind of like how cattle yeah. decapitation is you know what i mean like most people don't see them that way anymore you know what i mean like but yeah, one except, of for, that... except for the reverend carl <laughs> them because he says that they don't uh they're not necro enough so. <laughs> yeah they're not necro enough <laughs> they're not cult no, they're, enough i need to i need to listen to listen to their stuff well yeah check out sun eater tell me what you think all right all right I mean, I, um I, this next year up... was the year that i got into uh to um uh <laughs> no um uh what's that one band um uh fuck now my brain's not the the brutal death metal band um dying fetus dying fetus yeah because of because uh because well, that was long, over, and, long yeah, overdue so. uh that band is fantastic so now, um, now, now it's time to get into Job Quick Cowboy, I guess. For, so, <laughs> yeah, definitely. All right, let's uh, let's check out this band, Falter Comer. Uh, they've just signed with Century Media Records. It says here, Symphonic Black Metal Collective. Uh, Falter Comer are pleased to announce that they've joined forces with Century Media Records and at the same time present a new single, uh, Das Peitschendicht, Gedicht, whatever. 
<laughs> the Americans are also pleased uh, to introduce French bassist Laurent David as their new permanent member. Comments the label on the signing, breaking boundaries and redefining music. We're thrilled to welcome Falter Comer to the Century Media family, unveiling their avant-garde sound. Their brand new single uh, is a powerful ode to female empowerment and the art of BDSM. Fronted by Andromeda Anarchia, the operatic black metal takes you on a journey like no other. Join us in celebrating this unique blend of art, sexuality, and musical brilliance. Um, we'll see. We'll see. I myself am <laughs> not prone to a spanking, and that uh, nun in the thumbnail, she reminds me a little bit of um, the what's the, there's a, there's a an English woman who was an English actress who was in Black Adder. Her name was. I'm trying to think. Looks like this band might be trying to be a little bit like opera nine or something like that band from italy you know like yeah hopefully 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 she's not doing opera singing as at least you know i'm hoping that it's just a black metal singing like. miriam margoyles is the woman's name or oh, margulis yeah sorry not margoyles margulis <laughs> miriam margulis look up miriam margulis black adder season two that thumbnail reminds me a lot of that but anyway let's uh let's hear what it sounds like Who's gonna go first? I like the first part of it. Okay, um, I don't know. I don't know. I guess we'll see what happens with these this, this, this singing. But uh, I do like how it's using the the video is using clips from Hoxon, which is cool. That old the old um, old silent film all about devil worship and witchcraft, which is one of my favorite movies. So I do yeah. like that they're using that that stuff from from clips from that. And yeah, I didn't mind that first that first section, and I like the drum sound. It sounded cool, and yeah, it didn't really bother me. So I don't know. I guess we'll see how what, how does these opera vocals go. <laughs> well, so uh, I was wondering about the pronunciation of some of the words. I mean, I'm not I'm not German, so I can't I can't really tell you probably. But it, I it, don't either. The the woman. So the the singer's name is Andromeda Anarchia. Like the the pronunciation sounded particularly harsh to me. But I just checked now. She's from she's from Switzerland. Um, but she she is uh, relocated to Brooklyn, New York. Um, yeah, I don't know. I like the riff. Uh, the, the, that, that, that opening riff, I think, is quite cool. I agree with you. I like the music video. Um, I, I picked up a couple of little clips there in the words. One of them is Fick Pistolen, which is Fuck Pistol. I think that's the direct translation. <laughs> um, so, you know, clearly the, the guy is being whipped because he's been misusing his fuck pistol. Uh, maybe, but that's probably the, the broad concept of the lyrics. But <laughs> yeah, let's let's hear where it uh, where it goes from here. <laughs>
I, I, I'm see. really dithering in my my view on this. There's some some parts that I think are really cool, like the bit that we just listened to now, uh, and then mm. there's some bits that just don't work for me whatsoever. Um, yeah. Like there was I that didn't... bit straight after the main singing, where she just kept on repeating the same melody but like changing the key, and it was almost it, it almost felt to me like they they didn't quite know what to how they were going to cross into that that kind of more aggressive bit that we got into now. And so they just put whatever they they could think of in there, and that's it. Yeah, I mean, I actually don't mind this that much. I kind of I didn't mind the singing part too much. Like like you said, I think that part kind of went on a little long. That, but then when they went back to the heavy part, it sounded cool. So um, yeah, I mean, I don't mind it. I'd be willing to check out the album. You know what I mean? Like it's yeah, it's yeah, not. I, I'm um, definitely. It's I'm, interesting, you know. I'm definitely happy to to check out the record. So I mean, you know, it's it's one of those where before I make any any wild judgments I, I i definitely need to hear the whole thing um i don't think it's one i can just go okay that's great or that shit yeah it's kind of it's, it has something about it that kind of interests me and it kind of reminds me of something that would have come out in the 90s like it has that kind of 90s feel of like you know the era of like bands like bethlehem and all kind of stuff you know what i mean it kind of feels like that a little bit you know well there was a little bit of, about it that reminded me of dismal euphony and that's not that's not necessarily a good thing that's yeah that, that's not that, a good thing that, that that was kind of the back end of when when black metal took a turn for the worse only to be finally salvaged by gorgoroth at least that's my that, that's my theory I, I i still contend i think admiorum satanus glorium was like uh it, it it wiped the slate clean of a lot of stuff that just or a lot of elements that shouldn't have been in black metal well i think you that, uh, that album in uh salvation my funeral mist was a really important one too yeah and agree a lot of kind of stuff that came out at that time all right we're going to check out the new song by acid witch in just a second but uh, i wanted to ask you what have you got coming up uh guest wise on soul Knox? well let's see so um this is coming out on Halloween, so today, as of Halloween, there's also going to be a extra extra episode I did with Cam, our friend Cam Unglesby, you know, from Black Flame Death Cult, which talking about Halloween and horror movies and stuff, kind of a little special. And then on the second, it's going to be the uh, second part of me and my friend Joe's um, Dan, Dan, epic Danzig Um uh, walk through or we're walk, talking about uh song by song through five five up to uh death red sabbath mm -hmm. and then um let's see uh and then next week we'll have uh ghoul um the band ghoul g-h-u-l you know from uk i almost and, thought um, for a second there you you were referring to charles from mayhem no no the the band ghoul um he's uh he's Yodi from that band is going to come on. We came on. We did a record episode talking about his new album, and they, um, his album came out this year, and he has another album coming out beginning of next year. So, and then I have an episode of Dry Wedding that week as well, and then the week after that will be Arcane Archivist, and then it should be uh, the band Ku from Finland as well that week. So that's the next couple of weeks going on. So excellent. Are you going to take a yeah. break over uh, what's name over Yule Tide? No, I got stuff. I got stuff recorded. I, I literally have the whole rest of the year recorded. So, oh, that's what awesome. I've been. I've been. I've been really busy. Yeah. Uh, so then, our episode for Nevermore is coming out on the nineteenth. Yeah. And, 19th um, of yeah. November. Yeah, nineteenth November, and that then my. The most, they, I think that I, I've already heard some of the critics refer to it as the most important episode of Soul Knox released <laughs> to date. <laughs> right. And then, and Carl then, Icara uh, at his most bristling. Yeah. And then on um, Thanksgiving, I got the Horror Hotel. We're talking about the movie Phantoms. Yeah. Have you ever seen that movie from the '90s? Uh, Which I, I have not. No. It's really, it's really cool. It, yeah, it's a movie from 1997. Um, stars uh, Peter O'Toole and Rose McGowan, and um, has uh, Ben Affleck in it. But it's, it's kind of about this ancient evil coming alive in the mountains. It was actually filmed here in Colorado, in Georgetown, Colorado. So it's a really cool movie, a cool book. Kind of, kind of has a little bit of that cosmic evil feel. And then, yeah, I guess we'll just go for the rest of the month. We got Darkness Weaves. Um, the next, we're, Mike and I are kicking off our um, the next stage of, of the Carl Edward Wagner series. We're going to be talking about the Kane stories. And then the last episode in November will be with Obsidian Trine. So I recorded an episode of KC from Obsidian Trine. So. Awesome. 
That's what's coming up for November. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's killer. I've got so I can I, I, I can real I can reveal what I have in the pipeline. None of it's been recorded yet. So, right. Um, this is this is actually going to be a fucking busy week if everything goes to plan. So Derek from Suffocation, I'm recording an episode of tomorrow night. Oh, sick. Aaron from Paradise Lost is this the night thereafter. Oh, and sick. And the following week, um, I've got Mark Whelan from Fuming Mouth. Um, I fucking lost my shit on episode 200 when I listened when I heard that um, Fuming Mouth single I don't know if you checked out the news rant on that episode but I I loved that and I was like this guy's got such a, a crazy story you know coming back from very ser serious leukemia I'd, it'd, be, it'd be great to have him on the show so I've uh, I've I've, I've got that organized like i said it, it remains to be seen whether it'll be whether it will happen uh and then um i've got in the pipeline the guys from the amenta are due back um and also the uh and sam loins from acra um cool. i want to get him back on as well and that'll be that'll be five and done for me and then i'm done my last episode is going to be december the 5th and then i'm going to be out until mid-january because i'm only back on the 8th of jan I'll have a shit ton of stuff to get through at work. So as far as, like, I wouldn't have the, the time to get back on the 8th of January and then have everything recorded and done for the 9th. <laughs> yeah. So January the 16th will be my next episode after yeah. December the 5th. And then I'll do, I'll like, January the 16th, the first three episodes will be best ofs of the year. Yeah, I'm probably going to do my best. I'm going to split up my, because I'm going to do a top 40 and split it up between two episodes because... Last year I did a top like some forty or thirty or forty or something. I did one episode and that was that was way too much. Even just by yeah. myself, I was by myself. It was it's like no, we're gonna do two episodes this year, and I'll try to get a couple different people on. So that's kind of yeah. I did plan. I did three episodes this year, um, and they were that was, was top thirty, so it was ten apiece, and and that's that's just just about enough, especially if you have more than one guest on. Um, so hopefully Mike is down to do the top ten because that's become a bit of a tradition. But um, yeah, maybe you should do one of the episodes with me as well if you're down with that. Um, yeah. We'll do. Uh, I, I Nathan from Gravier, I always get on because he's got some fucking cool suggestions. To, he's always got stuff to talk about that I haven't listened to. Um, you probably will ha will do as well. So if you if you're down with it, maybe we should do we should you should do part two with me this year or next year. Yeah, we can do that. All right, and I can uh, I can do part of my part of my list because so yeah. I'll obviously insult all of your stuff that I don't like, so and tease you and you know make fun and stuff. But so, <laughs> so yeah, maybe, you're not allowed to do the same back to me, right? Maybe uh, because I'll have my Soul Knox episode too. Maybe I'll do like a kind of a, a little bit of a, a condensed version in a way, like you know, ten, you know, so they're not exactly the same. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's yeah. What I do. Well, if you oh let's let we 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 we'll, we'll take that offline as they say in the in the business yeah. world <laughs> we'll we'll figure it out we'll figure out something that works because if it if yeah. it doesn't if it doesn't align with your schedule then that's fine um but it's always fun to guess i always like having you on yeah well i mean it'd be no. cool be fun to do some, do that so we'll figure it out all right so let's hear what uh the new acid witch uh smash hit single sounds like uh the song is called pranks you pranks. Of course, know. now I have to endure another fucking ad. Right, let me just change this real quick. <laughs> I might just, I might leave these fuck ups in so people can see. It's not always, it's not yeah, always as well. good times at uh, at, at Mean Street <laughs> Studios. Sometimes things go awry. <laughs>
You know what um, what this reminds me of? You, you, know, you know those shows that you see where you're in like the, the crummiest of the crummy bars and you're like the somebody is playing or like a band is playing and it's you you know they're 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 not a band that's ever gonna that's ever gonna break out beyond this bar but for whatever reason at the time they just sound fucking great that's kind of what i what i think of this i i the, every like there's so many parts of my brain that says this is junk but there's a there's a part of my heart that says this is fucking great yeah i think it's pretty good i mean as which are a pretty good band overall you know like um the songs i kind of like the the riff it's cool yeah the vocals are always kind of funny because he's kind of doing this kind of weird goblin voice which yeah but, uh, maybe maybe cut that out but yeah. speaking <laughs> of the goblin by the way did you see um uh, what's that friedenstahl is done and uh, michael is doing his own he's he's doing something different now i, I don't know he, he, i don't think he's announced the name of the band yet but yeah he's 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 taking it a different correct direction he said friedenstahl was too limiting which is a shame because i i really like friedenstahl yeah, that's too bad. I mean, his stuff he was doing that was pretty cool. So, I mean, I guess yeah. we'll see what he what he decides to go next. You know. Yeah. Um, anyway, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna carry on with that. Uh, I am gonna show you something. However, you mentioned Rose McGowan. Um, I don't know if I've sent this to you yet, or if you've seen it. But any anyone who anyone who has not seen this yet straight after this episode of uh, into the necrosphere go and watch this because it is a fucking absolute work of genius uh, <laughs> i just want to find one that's 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 suitable um so this is the comedian kyle dunnigan he does a number of different things but the best thing he does is something called the pussies podcast and they react to different things um one of them is they they're like they react to star wars they react to the wizard of oz uh, they've recently reacted to Snow White, um, but when you mentioned Rose McGowan, they use her in the intro of the um, uh, of, of of the podcast. I just want to play <laughs> you the intro, so just Myth. hold on. I'm just going to skip to the beginning. Yeah, you 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 have to see this. This is so fucking brilliant and so on the nose as far as our modern society is concerned. I am woman. Hear me roar in numbers too big to ignore. And I just want to say to the men of this country, just shut up. When we ride at midnight to kill all men, we will spare the trans. My name is Rose McGowan, and I'm obviously fucking brave. <laughs> Welcome to Pussies, the podcast about women, for women, by, by men, men who support, who support women. women. <laughs> <laughs> anyway make sure you check it out it's absolute genius but yeah i can't i can't hear the name rose mcgowan and not think of the opening to that show yeah it, uh, oh man yeah she's she's gone down a crazy path <laughs> yeah many m many have um all right let's do one more song and then uh and then we'll wrap it up um i'm not gonna i'm not gonna inflict uh, rivers of nile on you um that last yeah. rivers of nile album was it might be one of the most terrible things i've heard a band that i used to enjoy do maybe in my entire life uh here we go cannon fever <laughs> i was just about to say uh cannon fever uh we're gonna have to get, head back to youtube for that um but uh yeah that's a that's a perfect way to wrap this up <laughs> Um, I know you're a fan. Uh, the new single is called Kampf und Sturm. And, I, um, heard, I don't even know. I, wonder, I don't know this band. That's kind of interesting. You so don't know the band? World War I. No. Oh, shit. Oh, dude, you, you're in for a treat. So it says here, um, German black death metal outfit Canon Fieber have launched a brand new track off their newly announced EP uh, U-Boatsmann, which will be released on November the 25th, 2023. Uh, mix and mastering handled by Christian Cole at uh, Cola Keller Studio. Kampf und Storm is available for listening via Bandcamp widget down under. We're not going to listen to it on Bandcamp. We are going to listen to it on uh, on YouTube. Uh, I, I think I said this when I first um, when I first played them on the news rant. Uh, much like Instela, they've got some balls being a German band singing about, uh, singing about war in 2023. I mean, that just... You're just begging for the for the Reddit mob to come for you. But that being said, I I, I don't think they're sketch, and I think they're fucking brilliant. So you well, hopefully the song does them justice. 
It looks like they're kind of World War One theme, so. Yeah. So that's an intro anyway, so. I did. I did let that one run a little longer, but it's because I was uh, I was enjoying that chorus. What do you think? It's really good. Yeah, I like the um, I like that kind of doom section we got there too. Like, um, kind of almost reminds me of uh, Ausfix in a way. You know, like some of the doomier World War Ausfix songs. You know. Yeah. Like yeah, they kind of they kind of have that feeling a little bit overall as well. You know. When it comes to war, uh, like like war based black metal, death metal, they're not quite on the level of Panzerfaust, but um, they're very good. Yeah, I like it. I mean, it, you know, you have different different types of stuff. I mean, I think um, Panzerfaust is kind of like takes it to kind of extra level, which has like that kind of neurosis quality, but. When it comes to this type of stuff, this this is kind of in in the vein of like you know, like I said, like Asphyx and maybe a little bit of like they're not. This doesn't sound very much to me like Enstilla or you know like the Mardu no, no. or stuff. This is more like Asphyx, like Death Death Doom stuff. You know what I mean? I am very. I know. I've I've said this on the podcast many times, but I'll just say it to you again. I'm very glad Marduk have gone back to the uh or the arcane and the occult brute with their uh, with their new album because it is so much better than uh, Victoria. Yeah, I mean, like, <clears throat> I don't mind the the war themes for like an album. But I thought two albums back to back was too much because I mean, yeah, their their best albums, even when you go back to the '90s, in my opinion, the best Marduk is usually the stuff that's more, you know, satanic and like, you know, or stuff about death. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. um, I think, or you have an album like Plague Angel, which has a little bit of everything. You know, like. Um, but I'm very glad that they, I mean, they basically created a, a kind of, uh, in my opinion, you know, Mental Mori feels like a sequel to ROM 512 in the sense that it it has like the same themes. It even mentions some of the lyrics and the lyrics in Memento Mori when I was reading the booklet when I bought the CD, it has like, um, you can see some of the lyrics are even referencing some of the stuff from ROM 512. So I feel like it's definitely like, purposefully and i remember when before they released memento mori they also released like pictures from the rom 512 era and stuff like that so i felt like there was a purposeful kind of trying to connect it to that album you know what i mean yeah it it it, it felt to me to be connected to that and to wormwood and wormwood is remains my favorite Marduk album of all time i think it's a fucking work of absolute genius yeah i mean i, I think that for me uh it's more like 512 is probably my favorite but wormwood's right there you know like both those albums are fucking masterpieces you know what i mean yeah yeah no for sure all right my brother thank you very much it's great catching awesome. up with you as always you too man it's always great all right i will speak to you again very soon perfect thank you Bye -bye. for having me on jackie
Always a pleasure, my man. That puts a cap on another episode of Into the Necrosphere. If you stuck around until the very end, you have my thanks. Uh, I also want to extend my gratitude to my guests, uh, Mike Hill, Ralph Schmidt, and Carl Icara. Make sure you check out their bands and their podcasts. The links are in the description to the show. Uh, and if I were a betting man, I'd say you can expect to see them back on the show again at some point early next year. Uh, Carl and I caught up straight after we recorded the news rant. Uh, we're going to do something quite special for our uh, our countdowns of 2023 uh so uh, that's going to happen in january and then uh, hopefully mike and i are going to do our usual top 10 uh that has become a bit of an institution on into the necrosphere i'm going to wrap up with another sam hayne song one of my favorites that the band ever released uh it's a track called the howl but before we get to that uh i waited until the very end of the show to say this but if you watched uh the rugby world cup final this past saturday you would have borne witness to the greatest victory in the history of professional sports i have never been prouder to be south african than i was on saturday night uh and as much as i know for an absolute fact that none of them will see it well done spring box all right folks whatever it is that you're doing wherever it is that you are stay safe stay healthy and i'll see you bad motherfuckers again next week Oh